use headphones for best experience. special video. Uh, I'm recording this because, uh, as you can see, the number of subscribers to my channel, Ismartica, ASMR, will probably, of course I can't be 100% sure, but uh, it really looks like it gonna hit 250 thousand subscribers quite soon so I'm recording this a bit in advance because I wanted to do something special for this possible event and uh, yeah it feels so amazing that so many want to um, subscribe to my channel and support my work and I'm so grateful, uh, humbled for each and everyone who have chosen to subscribe to my channel or who have subscribed in the past and supported me or everyone who has chosen to watch any of my videos at some point, helping the channel to grow and um, everyone who has supported me in some way, like uh, leaving a comment or um, supported me on uh, Patreon, becoming a patron and um, donating through PayPal, for example, requesting videos, requesting topics, so I, I got the chance to to see what you what you would like to see and get so many new ideas about things I have never heard about and then I maybe finally did a video about it and the video got super popular so it's helping me so much the, uh, all the the contact with you and uh, yeah the whole community of course and also commenting, uh, giving me feedback, uh, answering, like, if I, if I have a question sometimes uh, in a video, want to hear your opinion or your thoughts about something, the feedback has been so great. I have had so many nice comments to read. For example, when I asked you, uh, what, um, how does ASMR help you? Those uh, replies were so fantastic to read. And more lately, uh, do you have synesthesia? I asked you, and I got so many interesting uh, replies and answers to that one. Or, uh, yeah, I guess I have also asked you what uh, maps you would like to see in, in the future. So that gives me a lot of help to choose, uh, choose maps for upcoming videos and uh, when it comes to comments I know that I sometimes don't reply on all the comments uh, I try to do it sometimes but uh, there are it has like reached the point when I impossibly can do that all the time for all the videos um, it depends I it feels a bit, I feel a bit bad every time I like ignoring a comment or don't show you that I have read it or don't reply in any way. But I hope that um, 
if this happens to your comment at some point that you don't see I have read it or I don't reply or anything I hope it doesn't result in you stop writing a comment because I appreciate your comment so much and next time I might uh, I might um, sit there and reply to just your comment so I really hope you don't stop commenting because of that I get so much uh, help from you through your comments and so much motivation um, yeah it really encouraged me and uh, and helps me to keep up this work so you really let me know that that uh, my videos actually help you and that you want to see more and that the work I do is important so it's fantastic to read all your comments so keep up the commenting so I appreciate it so much and it's fantastic that um, you give me this chance to do this uh, almost full time now and uh, I can do these uh, videos about uh, these things that I just find super interesting and fun to work with so thank you so so much um, the video I would like to or the special I would like to to today and the reason why I'm recording this introdu introduction is uh, actually kind of a request video um, because I've got requests for requests for um, uh, posting a longer video um, I have recorded uh, posted some two hour maybe one three hour video but uh, some of you have let me know that you would like to see like an eight hour or even more video because it helps you to listen to it all night for example uh, you don't want it to stop uh, and uh, disrupt your sleep or something or if you don't sleep to my videos just to maybe have it in the background for focusing helping you concentrate during the day it would still be nice for you to have like an eight hour long session of a non-stop video so I will try now to do a longer video and uh, I will do a compilation of um, old material some old material and also some new material that hasn't been um, shown on this channel before so the idea I got was I was looking, taking a look through my videos here. Yeah, we can start to look at my most popular videos. It's amazing to see that so many videos have been reaching 1 million views now, over 1 million views. I think it's more than 10 now. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. And thank you so much for watching my new videos and also keep watching my older videos because these ones are are a couple of, of um, years old now but, but it's still uh, it gets uh, it, it gets uh, views all the time so this one reached one million just a couple of months ago I guess but the video is three three years old yeah and it's also interesting to see that the, on the top of the list here my three most viewed videos are actually not map drawing videos I thought the map drawings were the most popular ones mm, but for some reason it's uh, the hieroglyphs it's the fast tapping and it's the reading longest word videos that has reached more than 1.7 million views each and then we have the map drawings, top three of the map drawings, or top four or five, it's only map drawing, map drawing. And this one is a map reading from Historical Atlas, um, that got really popular, also through a very long time. Uh, you were keeping watching it, um, so it reached one million only, 
also a couple of months ago, I guess. And uh, hopefully the Red Dead Redemption 2 map will reach 1 million views one day, I hope so. It's a fantastic feeling when you see the, the 1M here. This is a really ego boost video for me, as you can see. But anyway, uh, I have chosen to show you the videos in this order because if we take a look at the other end of this list, the not so popular videos. Those videos I have posted in the past that has not reached so many views for some reason. Um, and I was thinking, okay, 250,000 subscribers. But it would be nice to show you some of the older videos that might be good ones, I don't know. Uh, but maybe you just didn't get the chance to see them because uh, they didn't become so popular when they were new and they're not recommended so much anymore or they have maybe never been recommended so much. Um, so I was thinking, okay, 250,000 subscribers, but if we have a video that has less than 125,000 views, it means that uh, not even 50% of the subscribers have watched this video yet. And I would kind of like to give this video a second chance. And uh, for most of you, it will be a completely new video. And it will be a bit nostalgic as well, because most of them will be from a couple of years ago. So I was thinking about um, putting together a couple of videos so it will reach uh, 8, 9, 10, I don't know, up to 12 hours, I think 12 hours is the limit for YouTube, you can't have longer videos than that. So for example this one, uh, this is actually quite new, this is, uh, I published it uh, last summer, 2000, uh, 2021, Norse mythology names in vintage street maps, for some reason it didn't get so many views, uh, 124 views, 1000 views now, so less than 50% of the subscribers have watched it. That one I think could be a nice, nice uh, video to include. Also this one, Drawing Map of Brazil Part 2, History and Drawing Flag. I split this uh, Drawing Map of uh, Brazil video into two parts because at that point 2019 I think it was I thought two hours was too long for a video but now I know that it would have been much better to have a longer video because now I realize that you you appreciate longer videos um, so for some reason this second part didn't get so many views not at all so many views as the first part but I think it's a nice one. It's not so much drawing, it's more like uh, talking about the map and uh, that I have just drawn and talking about. It looks like I'm uh, ch checking some historical maps as well, drawing a flag. That one I could include, I think. Uh, this one I will include, uh, because I like this one. Uh, telephone dialing, deep voice. When it says deep voice, it's probably because I had a cold when I was recording, and then my voice gets deeper. Um, reading maps. So I like the idea of this one. Uh, for some reason it didn't get so many views. It's from 2019 as well. Uh, so it's 2021, 2019, 2019. And then... Maybe this one, counting houses on vintage map. map. I think uh, also it's a good one. From 2020, I think. And this one I could include. Old map of Sweden with distance calculator. Um, it's really old. It's from the beginning of uh, 2018. 
and uh, yeah you can see it's my 27th video I still had that number system back then I think it's a good one as well 106,000 views then maybe this one detail forest map routes planning and tracing 89,000 views it's from t uh, 2020 and maybe hmm. yeah these I would like to include I like these uh, ones when I say I like them I mean I like the idea and I was hoping maybe they would reach a, a bigger audience so that's why I'm trying to do that through this compilation video this is about the May flower pins in Sweden the yearly pin you can buy in Sweden for more than 100 years uh, also I did this video in two parts this is uh, part 2 no part 1 uh, 74,000 views um, maybe Where's part two? Okay, part two only got 43,000 views. Yeah, you see the idea of splitting videos, making part one and part two is not a good idea. I should have done a two hour video about this one instead of splitting. But, but yeah, uh, this one I would like to include too, right after each other. So you have part one and part two in the sequence. 43,000 views. Maybe this one is more Star Globe, Orpheus and Eurydice Myth, soft spoken, from 2018, my 37th video. Yeah, these um, Mayflower pin uh, videos are from 2018 as well. So, of course, 2018, the number of subscribers were like 20,000, I think. So of course this didn't get as many views as now when they were just released. So maybe I will take those. Let's see how many I can have room for. Um, and maybe I get like embarrassed about some video when I when I watch it. So I don't want to include it. But let's see. Um, there are at least a couple of videos that has less than 125,000 views that I think might uh, it would be nice to give them a second chance but also I will show you some video material that has not been released before so it so for those of you who have watched all my my videos remember all the old content you will also have some new material here and then I was thinking about the video to this one and uh, now I'm in Spotify um, so I, uh, you can you have been able to listen to the audio from this uh, video for quite some time now but it's a nerd cave figuring collection care ASMR um, that at some point I thought a couple of videos weren't I just felt that they were maybe not suitable for the channel anymore and I had planned to to uh, delete a bunch of videos uh, I deleted this one for example but then I kind of changed my mind when I because I read so many nice comments there were so nice comments to to those videos and I felt like I don't want to to delete those comments forever but uh, unfortunately I did it so this video is not longer on YouTube um, but then I got uh, I started to hear requests and uh, uh, you you asked me why where is the video I can't find it anymore the, it was my favorite uh, the nerd care figuring collection care video so then I realized that uh, okay this one maybe uh, was a favorite after all uh, even though the topic was a bit uh, different from my other topics perhaps uh, 
and I think it had like four between forty and fifty thousand views. So not so many of you have got the chance to watch it um, yet. So yeah, I thought I could include this one as well as a bonus. Uh, so you who miss it you know, will have a chance to watch it again. Also, I would like to include something completely new or um, it's not recorded. Okay, now we, we're looking at the videos in the chronological order here. We'll start from the very first video. So. Yeah, let's see where the Nerd Cave collection was. It was here between 46 and 48. It was the video 47 from 2018. Then in the beginning of 2019, here somewhere, I recorded a video about Australia. I had just been visiting Australia for the first time for, uh, three years ago and I recorded a video about Australia and I also recorded a video about Australia's um, railways uh, reading some timetables and uh, showing some maps, uh, railway maps uh, but for some reason I never finished that video I never edited it even though I thought it was a good material, uh, and I guess the reason was because when I when I uploaded these videos uh, in spring twenty nineteen, it was one of those moments when the channel kind of exploded. It has happened. Uh, I've been super fortunate to, to have this happen to my channel a couple of times. Um, so from having like 25,000 subscribers, it started to explode and uh, it was maybe these two videos, in particular this one, Drawing Map of the USA, who, who made that happen. So I think I kind of forgot that uh, Australia Railway video that I had recorded and focused more on map drawing. And I did my first map drawing of a fantasy continent here, uh, drawing Game of Thrones map for example. Um, so in 2019 I focused a lot on the maps as you can see, the drawing maps. So I kind of forgot about that uh, video and there are, I have a lot of uh, material that never, never got through and got uh, edited because I forgot it and but also my plan has been to someday I can edit it and upload it so I haven't given up uh, on those uh, videos I just it has happened that the new project started and um, then it goes a year second year third year and they have still not been edited but uh, so now I have a opportunity to do one of those old videos and uh, you will notice that since this um, compilation video will consist of mostly old videos from 2018, 2019, some from 2020 and 2021. I think most of them, almost all of them will have this, um, will be recorded by this audio recorder, the audio will be recorded on this one the first one I had. So the sound will be a bit more like this, maybe a bit more white noise in the background, but I think this uh, audio recorder is quite good at picking up my voice, for example. So I hope you enjoy a compilation video of this uh, Roland Eddie Roll audio content. So that 
that's uh, quite a long introduction. Now let's um, let's uh, continue with the actual videos. And I will start now. They will just uh, show up in a row, and I will um, uh, have timestamps uh, for each video, so you can jump to the video you want to see if it's some video you don't want to see or or if it's some video you're interested in watching so let's start with the uh, with the 2019 video about australia's railway system so thank you for watching and sleep well or have a good uh, relaxing day, focusing on what you're doing. Hi, welcome to another video. Today I would like to show you some maps. Also some uh, timetables over the trains, railways in Australia, and um, this map here you can see, I guess, all the different railway systems in the, the whole country, but I will focus on the area around Sydney today, but uh, this was a nice map that I found showing all the different systems in one map. Sydney trains, like the metro system, or the light rails probably. Then we have this orange color on this map. The, these uh, rail lines. It's the the original trains in the entire state of uh, North, uh, New South Wales. And uh, then we have this blue, green and red line here. That's the uh, intercity train. I guess something in between the city metro and the regional trains in the state. And I'm actually going to focus on these intercity trains. But let's see what we have more here. Around Melbourne, we have also the suburban uh, trains around Melbourne, metro system, I think you can call it as well. And then we have the Victorian trains network.
or um, yeah I think uh, yeah Melbourne has trams as well so I think the metro metro and the train network are basically the same you can tell the difference between those but the trams are not included on this map and then this purple color that's the uh, Victorian railway network so that's uh, also the whole state Adelaide. Here we can see also some kind of metro system or a suburban train network around Adelaide. And um, in Perth, we also have a couple of um, suburban train lines. And we have this line here, it's called the Australind. It goes from Perth to Bunbury. I think uh, this is a train that goes daily, maybe two times a day or something. And we have this. Uh, orange train line going from Perth to Calgor Calgory Calgary no, actually close Calgory it's called the Prospector and uh, I think this operates daily as well with one and then we have the Indian Pacific going all the way from Perth to the west to Adelaide And also from Adelaide to Sydney at the Pacific coast, the very east of Australia. And I think uh, that one operates only once or twice a week. And we have a train line called the calm from Adelaide through the center of the country up to the north, to the very north, Darwin, the north, northern territories. One of these longer railways through the country. And we have the, the Great Southern line between Adelaide and uh, Melbourne. Also from Melbourne. Way to Sydney. So the the uh, Indian Pacific and the Great Southern take different routes. And uh, this map you can also see some ferry. This is the spirit of Tasmania, and uh, also I guess it's a ferry, must be between uh, Bridport and uh, Lady Barrow. Then we have the uh, railways in the north uh, e 
East, Queensland. From Brisbane to Charlwood, we have the Westlander. And from Brisbane to Long Reach, we have the Spirit of the Outback. And we have the Spirit of Queensland, following the coast all the way to Cairns. From Brisbane as well. Around Brisbane, we have a suburban train system. And the the longest lines here could be the this one to Jimpai North and the south line to Varsity Lakes. And um, then we also have the inland Savannah Lander between Cairns and Forsyth. And then we have some ferries here. The MV Trinity Bay to Thursday Island and Cecia uh, Pamaga. Horn Island. And uh, we also have some ferries from Darwin, the TV, Chai Wee or TV ferry to the these islands here, just outside Darwin. And a uh, town called Furumiyanga. And also ferry along the north coast and Arafura Sea, the EMV Malu Trader to Nolomboy Cove. So this was the overview map I wanted to show you. This is a map over New South Wales state and the regional trains and also coaches in this area. So here we have Sydney, Canberra, Melbourne, Brisbane. So all these destinations are in another state, but otherwise it's in within 
New South Wales Broken Hill to the west Griffith Baga Baga Kutamundra City Trains Network, New South Wales Train Link, and I would like to focus on these lines. And I'll zoom in a bit so you can read. the difference between stop and the interchange and the end of a line or a route. You can see the difference here. These are the opposite of each other with the green center and um, white surrounding circle. This is white in the middle and green outside. Uh, the interchange is has another outline around so station is the interchange between the outer line and uh, the Newcastle and, and Central Coast line which you take to travel to the south towards Sydney I guess you can take the Hunter line all the way from Newcastle. And then from Hamilton, continues towards the west. You can see here, this area is called Hunter. So, um, the next stop after Hamilton is Varata, uh, Varabrook, Sandgate, Hicks 
Sam. Taro. Beresfield. Thornton. Metford. Victoria Street. East Maitland High Street Maitland From Maitland it uh, continues either to the north towards Tungong Tungok or continues another branch to the west. Let's see what happens if it turns uh, right here after Midland. Then we will pass uh, Telara, Mindariba, Patterson, Martins Creek, Hilldale, Valaroba, Viragula, and um, the end of line in this direction is uh, Dunco. But if we instead go from Maitland in this direction, we will reach Lochinvar, Greta, Brankston, Singleton, Muswell Brook. Aberdeen and Scone. Here I actually have a timetable for the underline. and public holidays. And this is uh, in the opposite direction, so from Scone or from from Dunkok to Hamilton and Newcastle Interchange. We can see at uh, that um, most departures starts here at Tellera. If you want to go from Scone, it's only one option here. 6.38 in the morning. And if you want to go from Dungok, then it's 7.49. And these lines don't stop at some of these stations. They won't stop at uh, High Street and East Maitland. Maybe they are not super far from uh, the Maitland station here. Field, Taro, or Exam. So I would suppose they would start from Maitland, but it 
was actually Ted Naira. Seems to be the um, starting point from for most of these trains. Telara or Telara, probably. Not sure. So you can see you can actually take a train from Telara to thirty one. Yeah, here you can see. Then uh, Maitland departures from Maitland to 34 and it's only two minutes to the next stop High Street and then three minutes to East Maitland because they're quite close to each other in these, all these stations and then Victoria Street Metford, Thornton, Bearsfield, Tarrow, Hexham, Sandgate, Warrabrook, Waratta, Hamilton. From Hamilton to Newcastle interchange, it's only four minutes. And it's like from 2.31 to 3 and 12, so a bit more than half an hour to go the, all the way from Tedra to Newcastle this early in the morning. see the distances on these kinds of maps where you only see the stations let's see how it looks here on the Dungog branch so from Dungog 749 Viragula Valaroba Hildale Martin Creek, Patterson, Mindariba, mm, this is uh, 40 minutes approximately, so it's not uh, that long distance, quite long distance I guess, but I guess Scone is most far away from uh, Newcastle. Talking about Newcastle, maybe we should take a look at the Newcastle, at the uh, Central Coast and Newcastle line. Here we have the central coast, the Tasman Sea, Hawkesburg. 
Raspberry River. Here you can see it's divided into two branches before reaching Sydney. One following the coast and one um, going via Stratfield and ending here at Town Hall. I'm oh, sorry, Central. This is a this is the uh, station central where all these ends up. There's some in a bit. Let's start from Sydney, since we're here at the moment. So from central. The station central, central Sydney. If we take this branch towards the north, we have the next stop, Town Hall. That's also in central Sydney. And Wynyard. And uh, Millicent's Point. We're on the other side of the river, the north north side of Sydney, and uh, this stop is called North Sydney. Saint Leonard, Chatswood, Gordon, and Hornsby. Hornsby is an interchange point for these two branches of the Central Coast and Newcastle Line. So let's see what uh, would happen if we started uh, from Central and, well, and um, if we were going this way. Then the next stop would be Redfern. Also seems like a huge station with a lot of interchanging options. And uh, then Strathfield, where you can change between the Blue Mountains line towards the Blue Mountains and this line towards Newcastle. And we have Eastwood, Epping, and then we'll reach Hornsby from this branch as well. Let's continue to the north and see where the train will stop. Point Clare, Gosford, Narara, Naya 
Niagara Port, Niagara Park. Lysaro, Orimba, Chagera, Wyong, Warner Vale, Wai, Morissette, Dora Creek. Avaba Fasifer Buragui Sorry Buragul Cheraba Cockle Creek Cardiff Kutara Adams Town Broad Meadow and this uh, interchange Hamilton talked about before and um, continue towards Newcastle We can. Mm, can't read this. Civic. Queen's Wharf. Newcastle. this line as well. The Newcastle interchange to Central via Stratford or Gordon. Stratford. Sorry, Stratfield or Gordon. This is also trains in the morning, morning routes, Newcastle interchange, or um, some departures start at uh, Wyong, you can see here, at least two between 7 and 8 in the morning. So this is Monday to Friday. And uh, from Gosford also we have some departures starting at least one or two. At least one or two, yeah. <laughs> And um, it's not um, any of these uh, departures that will stop on every station, as you can see. If you go from these stations, then you won't stop on every. Then you will only stop at uh, after Gosford. It will stop at Voy Voy. Hornsby, Epping, Stratfield, Redfern, and Central. Now I won't read this, what this letter means, but um, if you 
take this train from uh, Wyong, then it won't stop at Lisa Row, Niagara Park, Point Claire, Tascot, Kuluwong, and uh, also not in uh, Askin. And as you can see, this goes from Yeah, this is a um, train going, um, passing uh, Gordon, so you can see it's either Epping Strathfield train, all these, or it's a Gordon train. The Gordon trains actually, at least in the morning, not those starts from Newcastle. They start from other places like uh, Weehong and Gosford. Let's take a look at this one from uh, Weehong, 7.54 in the morning. It will stop at Targera. Orimba, Lisa Row, Niagara Park, Narara, and Gosford. And it will also stop at uh, Point Claire, Tascot, Kuluong, and Voivoy. And then Wanda Bean. Hawkesbury River, Cowan, Pirara, and Hornsby. So let's compare how long does a train take from Hornsby to Central this way? Uh, via Strathfield. So from 9.04 it will reach Strathfield at 9.30 almost half an hour and then Central 9.44 so it's half an hour from Hornsby this way and um, if we instead would we'll take this train from Gosford 7.37, Point Clare 7.41, Tascot 7.43, Kulawon, Voivoy, Perara, and Hornsby 8.25, Then it would stop at Gordon, Chatsworth, Artamon, St. Leonard's, Woolstonecraft, Waverton, North Sydney, Milson Point, Winyard, Town Hall 909. So already this takes longer. If we go via Hornsby, via Gordon, and then we reach Central at 912. From 825 to 912. That's uh, 35. 45 something minutes.
this looks like some kind of express train from Newcastle 9, uh, 620. It won't stop at Adamstown, Kotara, Cockle Creek, Chiraba, Boragul. It won't stop at uh, Awaba, Tora Creek, or Wai. Or Warner Wave. And it won't stop at Orimba, Lisa Row, Niagara Park, or Narara. It won't stop at uh, Pont Claire, Tascot, Kulua. Because then you have this train instead. Three minutes later from Gosford, you have this. from these stations and then from Voivoy it goes next stop will be Hornsby and then Epping Strathfield Central so it won't stop at Wunderbein or Hawkesbury River or Cowan or Beraura, or Askint, or Gordon. Yeah, of course, not Gordon to to Town Hall because it c takes another route. So yeah. So that was interesting. A lot of different routes, or I mean, different uh, stops on the way. Yes, no train. Yeah. And the uh, around noon or on the I mean not in the morning hours, the rush hours. Then you can see trains st stopping at more more stops here. So from Newcastle interchange nine thirty five then to Hamilton Broad Meadow. Adamstown, Kotara, Cardiff, Cockle Creek, Chiralba, Uragul, Fassi Fern, Awaba, Tora Creek, Morissette, Wai, Unarvale, Wyong, Tagera, Rimba, Lisa Row, Niagara Park, Narara, Gosford, Point Clare, Tescott, Kulewong, Woi Woi, Wonderbine, Hawkesbury River, Cowan, Birara, Hornsby, Epping, Strathfield, and Central. And this route takes, let's see, 9.35 to 12.29, 9. 10, 11, 12, it's almost 3 hours, 3 hours, minus 6 minutes. And if we compare to this um, morning departure, it started from Newcastle, 6.20, and reached Central at 8.00. Fifty-seven, so that's six, seven, eight, two hours, thirty-seven minutes. So it differs a bit.
think we're done with the central coast, Newcastle line here. Let's take one more. I'm actually interested in this one, the south coast line. It goes from Bondi Junction in East Sydney, close to Bondi Beach. Or at least you can take a bus from Bondi Yun Junction to Bondi Beach. If you don't want to walk, it's quite a distance to walk from there. And um, because uh, it passes uh, central, of course, like all the railways, all the trains do. And Redfern as well, and then um, a one line here going to Port Kembla, and one line continue to Clar Clama and Bumateri. Junction. We have uh, Edgecliff, King's Cross, Martin Place. Actually, I remember all these uh, stations, from, these names from when I was visiting Sydney. And it was uh, one month ago. A kind of. this name and uh, then we have town hall and uh, central redfern sydenham or wallet no sorry no. redfern and Wally Creek. I think I should zoom in a bit. So you can read as well. So from Wally Creek. Next up will be Hertzville. Sutherland. Waterfall, Helensburg, and uh, Otford, Stanwell Park, Coldcliff, Scarborough, Wombara. Dale, Austin Mare, Thirold, 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 probably, Bully, Wunona, Belambi. Corimal Toraji Fairy Meadow North Wollongong Wollongong And then we have these uh, trains turning left here to Lysots, Cringela, Port Kembla North, and terminates at Port Kembla. 
what, uh, what this? It's like a very narrow peninsula here. And uh, from Wollongong, we have, if we continue along the coast, we have Coniston, Unandera, Kembla Crunch, Tapto, Albion Park. Oak Fee, Oak Flats, Shell Harbor Junction, Minamura, Bombo, Kiyama, I thought it said Kalama before, but it's Kiyama. Kering Kong, Barry, and Pumateri. And that's the last stop on the on the South Coast line. Bondi Junction, Town Hall, Central, Redfern, all these stations in the Central Sydney and um, following the coast like this, Puma Dairy. You can actually see Puma Dairy here on this map showing country, Pomodari and Kiyama, Port Kembla, Wollongong, all these are from, from this south coast line. And here you can see Newcastle and Gosford, red color here, from the central coast and Newcastle line. And here you can see sea scone as well that we looked at in the hunter line at the very beginning. Maybe this is the Dunkirk branch. I'm not sure. It also says Pumadari. Nora. On this map it says only Pomadera. Pomadari. And I have a timetable for the south coast line as well. Pumadari or Port Kembla to Central and Bandai Junction. Also, some morning trains here. Here we have one train from Pumadari, 6.43. And uh, it uh, passes Barry, Keringong, and reaches Kiama at uh, 7 10. It won't continue. Kiama is the last stop. Train terminates there. But of course, you can change to this train. Leaving from Kiama 7.13. Isn't that the same train? No, maybe there are like more, more uh, carriages 
this something like that I don't know but uh, from 7.30 you can take the train from Kiama and uh, it will uh, ne the next stop will be Pombo three minutes later Minamura Shell Harbor Junction Albion Park, Tapato, Unandera, and then um, yeah, it can stop at Port Kembla because it's another branch. But the next stop will be actually Coniston. So to me it looks like uh, Coniston was on after, I mean after this branch had turned to, to the left, but actually this branch also can stop at Coniston. As you can see here, the branch from Port Kambla 708 also stops at Coniston 10 minutes later but from Coniston it will then stop at Wollongong and it will uh, leave from Wollongong one minute later and then uh, stop at North Wollongong then it will not stop at uh, couple of stations here. The next stop will be the round, then Austin Mayor, and then Helensburg. Sutherland. So it won't stop at these. Not these as well. The train from Port Kambla will stop at all these stations. So, yes, they like this is like an express train from Kiama. So, Sutherland, Hertzville, Wally Creek. And Redfern Central Town Hall Martin Place King's Cross Edgecliff and the last stop Bondi Junction. And um, We'll take the train, start 6.37, reach Central at uh, like uh, 8.45, so that's two hours and um, eight minutes. And then um, 13 more minutes to Bondi Junction. If we take a look at this uh, train starting from Port Kambla at 7.08, it will reach Port Kambla North at 7.11 and Quinjila at 7.13, Lysots 7.15, Coniston, Coniston 7.18, Wollongong 7.20 It will leave from Wollongong one minute later and then it will stop at uh, North Wollongong Ferry Meadow Tauraji Kurimal Belampi Unona 
bully Thorald 739 From North Wollongong it took 23 33 Like 16 minutes And uh, this When you don't have all these stops it took only And then Austin Mare, Coldale, Wombara, Scarborough, Coldcliff, Stanwell Park, Otford, Heldensburg, Heathcote, and Redtine. Sutherland, Hertzville, Wally Creek, Redfern Central, and 905. As you can see, none of these trains from Bomaderry or from uh, Port Kembla stopped at uh, these stops here because um, then you have to take uh, this train starting at the route. Sutherland, Hertzville, Wally Creek, Sydenham, eight thirty three, and Redfern Central Town Hall, Martin Place. King's Cross, Edgecliff, and Bondi Junction, 8.55. So it will take one hour, and uh, uh, 40 minutes, approximately. Central, it will take one hour, one and a half hour, seven twelve to eight forty two. Here, mm. a bit 
later in the morning here. 7.56 and 8.16 we have some trains stopping at Central, so not every train will continue to Bandai Junction. Maybe it's... Uh, I don't have uh, the rest of the timetable here, but maybe it's something you know, for, for rush hour. I don't know. A lot of people work in the city. save the other railway lines and timetables for next time I think so thank you so much for watching this video hope you found it relaxing and uh, sleep well see you soon Association in Stockholm, Stockholm's Bell Telephone Aktiebolag. Printed in here it says nineteen seventy seven, but here it says eighteen eighty three. It's an alphabetic order of the members, those who have a telephone at home in December 1883. And um, first I'd like to call Axel. Burian. 
i Libsert Glasia Holms torg 9. Could it be this one? Plus your home story, not sure. But I guess that's where he lives. And um, his number, telephone number is, it says here, one, two, nine, four. Actually, since this is a quite old phone book, I have to call some numbers before this short number. So um, it's the the country code, telephone code for Sweden first, zero zero four six, and then the uh, region code for Stockholm. That's eight. So there was no answer there so to move on, see if I can find another friend I can call. Quite close to Blasi Holman, but it's actually on 
ladegårdslandet. And number seven should be possibly here somewhere. Are there either? So I'm going to go on, see if I can find some more prints. Here we have C. August Holmberg. name was actually Carl August, Carl August Holmberg, and um, his number, telephone number is 1053. Are here either. I wonder where he could be. But actually, I have another address here. Yeah, but it doesn't matter because he only uh, has one uh, telephone number.
is if the telephone is on Northern Scotland or if it's on Mount Greenland Scotland 36. Mount Greenland Scotland is not so far from Northern Scotland. It's here, it's here. Northern Scotland was here. And uh, only two blocks from that street we have Mount Greenland Scotland. 36, I'm not sure. Could be here in the middle. I guess I have to go on. Find another friend to call. Here we have our V Lundin at Garvarigatan 7 and our V I think if I remember right it's uh, Anna Valentina The uh, Garvari got down seven. Let's see if I can find that address. Garvari got down. Solomon. Short street here, Calvary Cut. Between uh, Kung Solomon's Toriet and Parmeter Cut. Let's go on. Here we have J. P. Holmberg. at 
the Adolf Friedrich story three. And uh, Adolf Friedrich story is located here. See if I can find the right. This is Southern Malum and uh, yeah. here it is, Adolf Friedrich's story between uh, Hunschgatan and St. Paul's Gatan. And um, JP. No, I can't remember his name. Maybe John Patrick. John Patrick Holmberg. Um, number. The telephone number is six nine three. from JP. So I have to go on, I guess. Actually, all the, the street numbers in Stockholm start from this direction, from the castle. So if a street goes in this direction, you can say that the lowest numbers are here, the highest numbers are here. So, I guess here somewhere, number 14 and uh, 19. The 
phone number to John Lehmann is nine o seven. And I'll try to call Matilda Langemeyer. Then I have to check this. About in retning number four hundred seventeen. Wonder if that could be on. Here we have Norbro connecting the city, old town, to normal, the new city. I wonder if that bridge here, a bit to the west, could be old. Should be a more zoomed in here. here it is. Hmm. Yeah, actually, it says Gamla Norbro. Here we have the castle. room the railway so the old bridge actually followed the Vesterlongatan here in the old town the new bridge started directly from the castle so these blocks should have this bath or swimming pool or something where she works and um, the number the telephone number to this place and to Matilda is four one seven
Um, store for tools. Janvaro Ripate. At uh, Regeringsgatan. Do a quick check to see where this uh, store is located. Regierings Gatan. Also here at Norman somewhere. Yeah, it's this one. Actually, following from Norbro here. To the north. Here's Gustavo Adolf's store. That's where the street starts and then one of the main roads. South, north. street numbers here so I just assume it's here somewhere. And um, telephone number to H Klein Khan. Her name is Henrietta, actually. Henrietta Kleinka. Number one, two, four, Are there either not easy to connect with my friends today? I think I do one more try.
Joyce Gatton, 40. And yeah, here you can see the shop he has selling uh, various tools on Kaljuan's story. But uh, his office is in Yantris. On the Antrox cut on foot. Yeah, toys cut. Yeah, that's in old town as well. So here we have Jan Toyet. Jan Toys cut on is this small street. Here we have Gunnam Story. No, sorry, call you one story. It's where the shop is located. Call you one. It's here. Just at the other side of this uh, dock. See, look. Call you one story. This office. First try at the office, see if it's there. So the telephone number is one one five.
I had no luck in um, getting connected with my old friends today. But maybe I'll give it another try soon. Again. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it relaxing. And, uh, take care. Stay safe. And, uh, see you soon. Thanks for watching. Bye. realized how much I love nerds and um, then I started to think a bit about the, the reasons and why and um, come up with some thoughts that I would like to share Because I've been thinking a lot about meaning, as you might recall from one of my previous videos, recent videos, to that it can be hard to find meaning in what you're doing every day. I think um, it's really hard to find meaning for humans, for people. And um, what we're taught and trained to do is to find a meaningful job. So we get money and can survive. But uh, the thing is that uh, I guess have of course no numbers but many many people don't find their jobs meaningful I guess and uh, as you heard in the video perhaps I'm one of them mm. but uh, of course there are kind of uh, jobs that that are truly meaningful I mean they're helping people like if you're a psycholo psychologist or doctor or teacher there are a lot of jobs that, that there's no doubt that it can be meaningful because I think meaning when I think of meaning, it's about helping people. But then there are all the other jobs. For example, the advertising industry. That I work in. Um, that I just can't. Of course, you're helping this economic system go around and um, generates money, and of course, people can survive.
because we're living we're depending on the system of money since many thousands of years now mm. but I think um, it's hard to even though it's been going on for thousands of years it's hard for the brain to accept this that this is meaningful but then there are nerds collectors that find meaning in something that no one could guess perhaps like postage stamps postcards yeah what not and uh, that gives them meaning I think and when you think about it it's not more or less meaningful than a job that just generates money and nothing more you can think of these things as meaningful or meaningless it's all up to you to give meaning to what you're doing it's just sad that um, one thing is generating money gives you money make you survive in this world and one thing mostly often cost money so you have to do it on your free time after working all day but I was searching for some videos when I couldn't sleep last night and I search for stamp my stamp collection I think and I found so many videos that I liked and these weren't even ASMR videos they were just people showing their collection stamps and that's when I started to think about this how oh, fantastic it is with people that so put their heart in one thing that's I guess it's what we're programmed to do even if it's a either if it's a job or a hobby So I started to think about the situation, maybe when you're a kid and have older brothers, sisters, let's say you're six or seven years old and your older brother or sister never, it feels like they never want to be with you or talk to you they find you just annoying and you're disturbing everything everything that they're doing they think that you can't play with them and um, you want to do is go into their room to their room see all the things they have there so mysterious and exciting and it's really a dream
dream. And one day the dream just come true and you're invited to this room. You're suddenly allowed to enter the room. You're invited and you sit together on the floor and they let you look in some books that they take from the shelf and spread it on the floor and you look together in all these books filled with postage stamps you've never been allowed to see anything or touch anything and uh, you just turn the pages of book after book it feels like it's going on forever for hours and your older brother or sister talks and talks about these stamps, what's on the stamps and what countries they are from, how old they are, and just tell you a lot of things, stories, while you're sitting there, and that feels very good and relaxing makes you very happy. Unfortunately, I don't have a book of stamps. I used to have, actually, but I don't know where it is. Anyway, I have these uh, small plastic figurines since I was a kid. And I think I have talked a little about the Mr. Man figures in a previous video. I think it was the um, map drawing video about um, Ireland and um, Great Britain. Now these are really dusty, they have been standing on a shelf for many years. These are created by Roger Hargreaves in the early 1970s. This uh, Mr. Man. So Mr. Greedy is eating a cake. Maybe a bit annoying for the ASMR community. I don't know what these are called. A bell, of course. A bell. It's holding a bell. shoes when I was a kid. I guess there's 
supposed to look like some old English ships, perhaps. And here we have Mr. Silly. Do we have next Mr. Strong? smiling couldn't this be like the birth of the smiling if this is from 1972 
So these are the Mr. Men that I have. And um, what I wanted to do today is I would like to draw their houses and like uh, do a landscape landscape drawing with the house for each of this uh, character and put it in a landscape so nine houses well, I'm not sure if Mr. Daydream has a house I think he's just a cloud so it will be eight houses on this drawing and then when I'm finished I think um, you could use this piece of paper as a mat to play play on with these figurines and um, To see how their houses look like, I have the books here. So it's Mr. Greedy, it's Mr. Happy, in Swedish, Gubben Lycklik. Mr. Silly, also in Swedish, Gubben Knepp. Mr. Daydream, Gubben Dog Drum, in Swedish. Mr. Tickle, Gubben Kinekirk. Swedish and Mr. Funny, Mr. Strong, Mr. Shatterbox, and Mr. Noisy. So, one thing with these books is that they're always start in the same way that you are presented to this character and uh, to the house where this particular character is living so let's start with uh, Mr. Happy I'll also try this lemon drop see Mr. Happy's house just by a lake and a mountain and some hills but I'll just draw the house I think this is called the country where he lives it's called Lycklig Landet land I guess in English It's a white house with a blue door and it's a red roof.
chimney. I've always been a fan of the of this super simple way of drawing with this uh, really thick black contours and just plain colors like childish in a way. Okay, there we have Mr. Happy. Let's see how the house of Mr. Noisy looks like. Here it is. Okay, so it's on top of a hill. so many people perhaps and it looks almost the same as Mr. Happy's house so let's mm, let's make this to a hill This is more far away in the distance. So this is where Mr. Noisy Let's go on with the um, green corner here. Can you see? I hope it's not from one of these pens. Okay, so no, someone has been drawing here before. I bought this from eBay. Some years ago. Okay, Mr. Chatterbox, how how does your house look like? Here it is. It's this kind of uh, box shaped house. Looks really nice. I'll place his house just here. And there are some curtains and these windows and the chimney with smoke and it's a um, white house red chimney Uh, let's introduce
use some jello for the door. some bushes outside the garden okay we have three of the houses on this strong actually when I took a quick look in these books can't find a picture of his house that's odd here is what you can see also a white house yellow door and um, blue curtains with white spots. So I think I will instead choose to draw this barn actually. It's nice to have something looking a bit different this drawing. So I'll put this barn a little bit in the distance I think. Maybe this black pen is a bit thinner. I need a thinner tip for this. strong will lift up like this and fill with water trees and bushes so good with uh, Roger Hargreaves drawings is that I think anyone can draw it if they try every kid every person we 
really simple. So here we are, Mr. Funny Brown Teapot, that he lives in. roof of the teapot, the house, and there's some light orange door, it's strange, it's actually almost the same color. We call it the Tröskeld. And a uh, doorstep, of course. And, 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 and. He has some really colorful curtains. So it's one dark pink. This room. Stairs. It's one that is more light pink. I, don't, I only have one pink pen here, so I would try to just paint a bit lighter like this. And um, red. this really soft roof. I just thought it looked really soft because of these corners. But I have no idea what it's supposed to be, what type of roof it's gonna resemble. Oh. 
more. That was a really simple house to draw. So we put some yellow here on the roof. Red door, red chimney, and we're done. So that was the house of Mr. Tickle. And as I said before, Mr. Daydream doesn't have a house as far as I know. Mr. Silly sure has. This is gonna be a nice one as well to draw. He has this silly house. That I am gonna place just here to the right. Stairs and then some stairs, diagonal stairs to this, I suppose, bedroom perhaps, upstairs. And it's a yellow. This time we have a green door, believe it or not. Isn't that silly? Red house and it's a red.
Now the roof is some kind of olive green brown yellow I don't know I think I'll choose yellow yellow visit each other having tea I think these are really good friends Mr. Silly and Mr. Funny city of uh, Tokanchin's state and uh, this uh, capital is called Palmas located in the middle here somewhere let's put it here so this is Palmas can't believe I I missed it in the last So finally here we have all the capitals, all the state, and federal district of Brazil and now if you want to see the first part of this video um, which I'm drawing this map then check out the link down below in the description box. Now let's go on with uh, part two of this video. So this was actually, I have to say, quite a challenge to get all these states right. And um, the 26 states and one federal district, I kept saying 26 states all the time, but they're like 27 if you also count the federal district. Now we have our map and I like to talk a bit about Brazil. It's a really interesting country I think, both historically and I mean the landscapes and the um, biodiversity and everything. Um, I'm not 
sure exactly what I should talk about, but I have read a lot. And um, let's start with the the nature, perhaps. Perhaps you can tell some more about it. So I have mentioned, of course, the Amazon rainforest here. It's the biggest uh, rainforest in the world. And um, we have the highest mountain top of Brazil here, just at the border between between Venezuela and Brazil. The Roraima. No, sorry, <laughs> it's not here. It's here. It's between the Amazon Amazon uh, state and Venezuela. Uh, it's called Pico da Neblina. Highest mountain, highest mountain peak. And I read that it wasn't discovered until 1950s because it's always like um, covered in, almost always covered in, in uh, mist. And um, yeah, we have the the Guiana Highlands here, and the Brazil Highlands here, and uh, Amazon Basin, and um, in between the island and the basin here, we have a savanna called the Cerrado, where it's a lot of farming and uh, ranches. And uh, the southern part of the Cerrado, of the Cerrado, we have um, the biggest, uh, largest uh, wetland area in the world. Actually, it's called the Pantanal. It's a really interesting area. There are natural, there are a lot of natural parks around Brazil. I guess uh, here you can visit this. Pantanal. Of course you can visit it, but I mean there are national parks. Um, then we have, to the very south, there are grasslands. And these are actually like a part of the Pampas. It's uh, about the uh, uh, geographically and culturally close to Uruguay and Argentina. It's quite diverse from the rest of Brazil. You can see that on the map as well, that it's like it's, um, there's no other place in Brazil this south. And uh, also this state, the uh, Santa Catarina, this, yeah, this state is Rio Grande do Sul. In, uh, here's Santa Catarina, and in this state, the Parana, um, it's like the high, very high ele elevation, so it's not uncommon to see snow here, even in the capital, Curitiba. So it's the coldest state in Brazil. And, um, yeah. mention some of the national park actually parks uh, like I said this was the Igatsu River and here just at the border to Argentina Argentina has a bit odd shape here because this is Uruguay and this is Paraguay but then Argentina actually goes in, in a shape like this like a panhandle and here are the Igatsu Falls very beautiful and famous um, waterfall just at the border and it's a national park called the Igatsu National Park in uh, 
Kaya. Yeah. Somewhere inland, we have the Chapada, Chapada Diamantina National Park. Um, the area is famous for its large diamond finds in the 19th century. There were a lot of mining going on here from the 18th century, I guess, when um, that's also when the capital was moved from from Salvador to Rio de Janeiro because uh, yeah, it was more close to the mines here and uh, Minas Gerais means the I think it means like the general mines so there were gold like a gold rush in the 18th century 19th century also diamonds so I guess that's why it's called Chapada Diamantina National Park but here it's like very unusual rock formations, caves and lakes. The highest uh, waterfall in the country, the Cachoeira de Fumasa waterfall. And you can visit um, incredible blue waters of uh, Pozo Encantado and Pozo Azul. That's a quite famous national park as well. And um, Fernando de Noronha, this island, quite far from the mainland, out in the Atlantic Ocean. And this is a marine national park with really beautiful beaches and a variety of marine wildlife, like sea turtles and dolphins and sharks. Um, there are actually, I've heard that there are a lot of um, beaches with sharks. Um, and I, I don't know what kind of sharks it is and I hope it's, they're not too dangerous um, in this area, this uh, northeastern area. Um, I can mention in Maranhão. The Lensois Maranhenses National Park. Uh, it's um, a landscape um, composed almost entirely of sand dunes. It's like a combination of sand dunes and water, so it's like water pools in the sand dunes. Sounds really cool. And um, in Sierra. We have the Jericoacoara National Park, also famous for its beaches and uh, sailing and windsurfing and things like that. Um, yeah, and in the wetlands here. Pantanal, the, the national park is called the Pantanal Man Mato Grossense National Park. And um, there are also a lot of national parks where, like, really old cave, cave paintings and um, Examples of the of the um, national parks. Let's zoom in a bit. So we can talk about the history of um, Brazil. Or first, maybe I should show you something from an old atlas. This 
This is a map of the age of the discovery, 1340 to 1600. It shows um, the sailing routes the Europeans had discovered this continent. And then, of course, before there were Native Americans living here. Um, in Brazil, mostly uh, the Tupi, Tupi tribes, and also, um, let's see, Tapuya tribes. I guess Tupi and Tapuya tribes were concentrated here to the the coast. And also there were some hunter-gatherers tribes in, in more inland and um, close to what's now Paraguay there were also Guarani tribes speaking the Guarani language. Um, and that's a very interesting language because it's an um, official language in Paraguay today spoken by very many people and also in the s in the southern states of Brazil still can hear Guarani being spoken I guess and there are a, a lot of tribes I guess in uh, Rondonia I think it's in Rondonia there are like 21 different tribes today with their own languages and even if they are related, I mean, there's... But the, I guess the main groups here along the coast were the, as I said, the Tupi and Tapuya. But then, um, when the um, story of uh, modern Brazil started, it was in the late... 1500s after Columbus returned from his first voyage 1493 then actually this is really interesting and strange but um, the Portuguese and the Spanish who had uh, or it was the Spanish who had done this uh, most of this um new discoveries and then um, the Portuguese had mostly been uh, sailing here around Africa and found the way to to India and they wanted to concentrate on the trading of, of spices here so what they did was that they went to the Pope and uh, the Pope divided the earth into a Spanish and Portuguese part. So all land outside Europe would uh, be either Spanish if it was um, west of this line and uh, Portuguese if it was east of this line. So I guess first they drew the line here and then one year after they decided to move it here. But the point is that this was before this piece of land was discovered so they thought they drew a line in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean so Spain would have all what was would be found in the in the new world that this was called the new world and uh, Portugal would have all this. So that um, that decision. I mean, a lot of history can be related to that decision today. But the thing was that uh, Portuguese um, uh, explorer. Cabral. His name was uh, Pedro Alvarez Cabral. By accident or not by accident, we aren't entirely sure. Uh, sailed 
and uh, found this piece of coast here and since it was on the east side of this um, line called the um, the uh, treaty of Tordesillas line it could be called because the, the, the treaty was called treaty of Tordesillas then um, declared it for Portugal and that's why Brazil today speak Portuguese and the uh, rest of the uh, or very big part of the rest of South America speak Spanish today but of course we have all the indigenous languages mixed today like Guarani I mentioned before so I mentioned before the the um, historically important uh, city of Sao Vicente Sao Vicente um, that was actually the first city founded by the Portuguese, first uh, permanent settlement in um, 1532. It was founded. And it was before uh, Sao Paulo. Um, but the location where Cabral landed was uh, here somewhere in it's now Bahia and it was called Porto Seguro and uh, all these uh, cities along the coast have a lot of history of the, the early explorers and uh, Portuguese uh, settlers and uh, from the time when Brazil was a Portuguese colony really long time and also like um, Salvador was the main slave trading hub so the the um, I mean there were a lot of slave trading from Africa to Brazil for centuries until finally 1888 when it was slave slavery was abolished um, not a single day too soon of course and so it's a lot of um, afro Brazilian culture here in Bahia, especially in, in uh, Salvador and uh, Recife, north of Recife, it's another uh, town called Olinda. It's also played an important role during this time. And um, actually, between 1630 and 1654, this was like Dutch Brazil, because uh, then the Dutch uh, tried to try to uh, colonize this part that Portugal had already had started to claim. And they, they, they named the cities in Dutch names like Frederikstad and Mauritsstad. Recipe was called Mauritsstad. But it was a short history in Brazil, short part of it, Brazil's history. Here, uh, close to 
uh, French Guiana actually used to be called uh, Portuguese Guiana next to French Guiana here and uh, at some point they tried to secede from the Brazilian Empire and uh, declared the Republic of um, Independent Guiana but I guess it was never recognized as an independent state by either Brazil or France but um, I've read that uh, still some um, French uh, Creole language was spoken spoken here in uh, Amapa and um, also this very southern part uh, the, the uh, Rio Grande do Sul and, uh, during a revolution uh, in I think it was in during the same time as Texas it was an independent state in 1845 or 1835 to 1845 the Farupila revolution or Ragamuffin war there were some it was a revolt m movement here um, but it wasn't it was never an independent state I guess Um, then, um, yeah, maybe I can show you the, the 15 colonies, the first colonies of, of Brazil, between like when it was discovered, or a few years after it was discovered, I guess the first years, Portugal didn't pay much attention to Brazil at all, but then when the French came and tried to try to colonize it themselves, then, um, then the Portuguese started to to send some people here and then sell pieces of, like huge pieces of land to some elite in Portugal and that became the first 15 colonies so it was like plantation owners who had uh, these pieces of land it was Maranhão it was uh, Ceará it was uh, Rio Grande Paraiba something called Itamaraca Pernambuco And uh, Bahia de Todos os Santos. I guess that must be around um, Salvador because it's a bay here called uh, Todos os Santos Bay. Ilheros, Porto Seguro, the first uh, place where Cabral landed, as I told you. And uh, Espirito Santo. Sao Tome, Rio de Janeiro, Sao Vicente, and uh, Santo Amaro. And I also think that the island of Sao Joao was uh, considered one of these 15 colonies. And then uh, in the beginning it was Brazil wood that was exported from Brazil because it was used in Europe for um, like a dye they uh, to get the, uh, some kind of orange or red color on um, very expensive uh, textiles but then I guess um, they also exported uh, sugar and later gold and diamonds and uh, also rubber coffee and other things since it started with this Brazil wood, it gave its name to Brazil. So 
So, Brazil was a Portuguese colony in the 16th century. And um, the uh, city of Salvador was founded in 1549 and was considered the capital for quite some time in this area. But then in 1763, after gold was found and all that, it moved to Rio de Janeiro. And that was the capital until 1960. Also, Rio de Janeiro was the capital of Portugal, actually, after or during the Napoleonic Wars, begin beginning of 19th century, because Napoleon invaded Portugal and the royal family uh, fled to Brazil, or like settled there for a while, between 1815 and 1822, this was the capital of the United Kingdom of um, Brazil, Portugal, and the Algarves. Algarves is uh, the southernmost part of Portugal. I mean, the, the Portugal on the Iberian Peninsula. But then, after 1822, um, Brazil became an um, independent empire. So it was a monarchy for during a um, long time in the 19th century. And I guess that could be the reason why it's so big and large country today. Because uh, there were the Spanish colonies as well during this time um, became independent. But they become republics, I guess, most of them. But um, Brazil was a monarchy, and that's probably why it was this empire, this huge empire, and it's now divided into separate states. But then in the late uh, 19th century, 1889, I think, then there was a, like, a revolution and it became uh, the first republic of Brazil. That was a bit of history in Brazil. And I'm really not an expert on this, so I, I put a link the description to the videos I've seen or some of the pictures I visited that uh, where I got the information from. It was really interesting to learn about um, Brazilian history for this video. I must say I didn't know much at all. Um, but I want to focus a bit now on this state, Bahia. And I want to talk about the music. Because uh, it's really interesting, Salvador, Bahia, Pernambuco as well, this whole area. Like I said, it was the main hub for the slave trade and uh, it's had a huge impact on uh, Brazilian culture. Um, it's like uh, the Afro-Brazilian um, uh, culture developed here, like the samba music and the rhythms that are like used in jazz, um, and there are some, some really interesting Brazilian sounds and beats, for example Bayal, I guess it means just that, this is, that it is from Bahia. The payao is a rhythm that is uh, like a basic rhythm that also can be 
you can hear it. Uh, it has influenced the bossa nova. Bossa nova I find really interesting as well. It's like samba, but um, yeah, the samba rhythm derives from here. And um, the bossa nova was, uh, I think it was in invented in 1956. I read, maybe you can't like, uh, you can't like uh, credit it to one person, but I, I read that Joao Gilberto like wrote the first Bossa Nova song in 1956 called um, called uh, Bim Bam, and he recorded it in 1958, and it was released on his album. And I listen a lot to I listen a lot to Astrid. Gilberto when I was younger and I remember this song Bim um, Bong see if I can show you the rhythm then we can do some tapping as well because um, yeah, these are my latest uh, supporters on Patreon, Paypal, Tingles. Thank you so much for your support. But, um, I want to show you the Bayao basics. So you use the Tresio rhythm. It's like uh, four beats and one ha I will do it in like two hands. Like four, four beats com combined with the three Beat to see you, and I guess the Bayao is uh, basically this rhythm. It's used so much in Latin music today, so it's have a huge influence. song, this song called uh, Bim Bong, oh, it's not easy to talk, and, and uh, concentrate on the rhythm. So Joao Gilberto, he was, uh, I guess he was from Bahia, and he created this uh, bossa nova, meaning uh, meaning um, uh, the new or the like the new trend or something it can be translated so he took the samba basic rhythms but uh, like um, made it much more simple so no percussion not all these drums and things just like guitar and uh, song it's like downscaled and I think it's very suitable for ASMR perhaps if you if there's one music style you listen to maybe it could, it could be Bossa Nova if you want to just relax and sleep I listen to Joao Gilberto lately and it's really relaxing actually so Bim Bon or something like this Jazz and Bossa Nova 
and um, also this uh, capoeira martial um, art dance that is uh, also from this area, ba Baya area it originates from there and um, also when you accompany this uh, this um, this dance or martial art then you often use the music instrument uh, Perimbao that I also found um, find very interesting I listened to a song by Astrid uh, uh, sung by Astrid Gilberto when I was young a lot I liked it, it was called Perimbao I didn't know what that meant then but it's actually a music instrument that I think could or originate from uh, Western Africa I, I don't think it's uh, completely sure where it comes from but it's a very special instrument that you use uh, especially for the capoeira and uh, its uh, music is often based on the bayao and um, the uh, berimbau is a music instrument that uh, I think looks very funny and it sounds really funny so super interesting let's uh, try to draw it here like a uh, bow and arrow in a way with a really flexible stick and um, and a wire steel wire and uh, then you also have a stone called the uh, Tobrai and a stick called the uh, Bakera and quite often also something that make me think of maracas it's a percussion instrument called the Kashishi uh, oh so I forgot, almost forgot that it's a fruit attached here. Dried and hollowed out fruit. A special fruit called kabasa or kalabasa. Some kind of gourd fruit. And um, you like put it close to, or you put it to his chest to give it resonance. And uh, you have to deal with all these uh, four parts just to play like it's just possible to play what I've heard two different tones. Dun, 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 dun. Um, but also you can make some variation with some buzzing sound and also some variation with the like a wah wah effect I think with this uh, with this uh, kabasa. So this is the Perimbao um, I think it's a super interesting music instrument and um, yeah, I guess the bossa nova and the samba rhythms uh, derives from from uh, Bayao and the music played the, with the berimbau, so bossa nova sound could be typical like this, or like. Yeah, I had to uh, 
short uh, extra bonus video about that song, The Girl from Ipanema, I think. I'd like to do that. I've started to listen to the, all these songs again now after after many years I haven't paid any attention. It's like uh, Joao Gilberto, Astrid Gilberto and Stan Getz. And the album Getz Gilberto from 1963. It's a really nice album. And it's so uh, like laid back music and it's I mean, elevator music, often it's not made with so much heart and warmth like these original songs was when, they, when they were recorded. So it, it's definitely more than elevator music, I have to say. You should uh, listen to it if you're interested. The last thing I'd like to talk about and um, also make some more drawing is the flag of Brazil. This is also something I found super interesting when I started to read about it. So the flag of Brazil consists of three or four colors. It's green, yellow, blue and white. And um, the middle is a circle or a sphere. And blue. And this flag has been used since 1889 when. Uh, First Republic of Brazil was uh, founded after the Brazilian Empire. And it's been some variation. It really resembles the United States flag because I'll show you later, but it's uh, considering the, the number of stars will represent the number of states and federal districts that um, make Brazil today. So it, as the states have been more, uh, have been added, then uh, they've had to add another star on the flag. But the stars I will add says Ordem eh, Progresso Ordem eh, Progresso Order and Progress Now to the really interesting part, the stars 
with one star here north of if you consider this as the equator of the globe then it's one star north of it and since there are uh, 27 states and federal district in Brazil there will be a total of 27 stars and they are located in a really interesting pattern because it's like star constellations from the southern visible from the southern hemisphere mostly is crossing so uh, part of Para of Para is located in the northern hemisphere so I guess that's why why they ordered like this and it's also represent the bright star Spica in the sky and here we have a star representing Procyon in the sky and it represents the state of Amazonas and uh, then we have the Canis Major constellation or the Great Dog. It's one, two, three, four, five stars. And um, they represent the, the um, states of the Northwest. So I guess it's um, Roraima, Amapa. Rondonia mm, that's three yeah, token chins mm, one two three four five I just uh, I can just see four states here but maybe if I continue I can see what the fifth state would be because then we have um, the star of Canopus and that star is representing the Goyas state. Here we have a small star, but it's actually the South Pole star. That all the other stars are circling around in the night sky, in the southern hemisphere. And that small star is actually representing the federal district in Brasilia. Here we have the constellation the Southern Cross, one, two, three, four, five stars. And um, this constellation represents the, the states of Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, Bahia, Ma uh, Minas Gerais, and the Espiritu Santo. So it's the states in the South East basically, but also Goyas and also Bahia. And uh, these two stars are quite far from each other. They represent the constellation um, Hydra and the states Acre and uh, Mato Grosso do Sul. Yeah, so one of these five must be Mato Grosso as well. I think so. I'm not completely sure. Um, 
and then there are eight, no, there are three stars here representing the uh, South Triangle constellation, Southern Triangle. So three states should be attached to these stars in the flag. And uh, now, now let's see, it's uh, Rio Grande do Sul, Santa Catarina, and uh, Parana. So it's the south, southern states. And then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight stars in the Scorpio constellation. And that's the small states in the northeast. It's Maranhão. Piauí, Seara, Rio Grande do Norte, Paraíba, Pernambuco, Alagoas, and Sergipe. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah. So that's what these stars actually represent. It was so cool, I had no idea. before I read about it on Wikipedia. So we have the flag, we have the Perimbao, we have the supporters, my latest supporters. I want to thank, give special thanks to And we have the map of Brazil. been really fun to do this video and I um, hope you really hope you enjoyed. Thank you so much for watching and um, see you soon. Don't forget to subscribe if you want to see more map drawing videos. Also you can check the description box to this video if you want to see more um, my older map drawing videos. There are quite a few now, quite a lot of them. Um, I have a list there. So thanks for your support, thanks for watching, and uh, sleep well. show you this map. It's an old map of Stockholm and the surrounding areas. And you can see here in the corner And it's from 1932. Concept Carta of Or Nitton under And here on the top it says uh, 75 Stockholm. Sydost, that's south east. Here's the center, or actually the old town. Here's the central station of Stockholm. I like this map because you can see all uh, all the small houses here. So I thought we could uh, maybe count houses and uh, trace some streets perhaps.
So why don't we start here in Sturibi? Here we have a road. Let's count some houses here. on the right side of this road. Here we have another road. And I go You can see railway, it's actually a tram. Today we have the metro here. To this point from from the north here, and then it turns to the south, and this part of the tracks are not here anymore. Let's count these houses here. the southern part of the railway. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve little houses. Actually, easier to count houses in a block like this, in the area between roads instead of following roads, I guess. Let's count the houses in this block. this 
this area, ten little houses. Then we have this area. in this area. in this area. totally flat at the foot of this hill. So you can actually ski from Sturebi to Ingede. Let's count some houses in Ilhred as well. First, this group of houses. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. square. We have a small group of houses. One, two, three. And these blocks are really narrow. Let's count in these narrow blocks. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty, forty, fifteen.
works a bit on this area here. There's another railway. Here's the tram. Looks like they're connected somehow here. But I'm not sure. They're not, today they're not connected. This is rebuilt to Metro, like I said. And I'm not sure how much of this part of the railway that's still here. Today we have another railway going like this. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly how. Uh, I think it has a stop here and a stop here somewhere. So it's used now for public transportation, but at this point, 1932, this railway was not used for public transportation. This is an old part of Enskede, Enskede Gård. Let's count some houses here. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. Eighteen houses here. Eastern part of this area. Now let's count the houses in the center part of this area. in the western part of this area. One, two, three, four, five, six. Let's take a look at this area here. It's part of Inghede as well. And let's count this, the houses along this street here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Actually, I think I will use this magnifying glass now. To be able to count more accurate. And I'm gonna hold it close to my eyes. See if it makes any difference.
Let's count these houses along this road. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, And now let's count the houses along this road. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. On the north side of the road, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Now let's see Maybe we can count all the houses in this area, West Barrier See how many houses there are in this area. I think I will only count these closest to the forest. In this area here called Axel's Bay.
32. Some areas there are no houses, you can see on this map. Actually there are houses, but for some reason it is marked here as a pattern. Lines like this, really small lines. But here in this corner, you can actually see the outlines of the silhouettes, two houses. Also here in this area. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Here as well. Along this main road, you can see also there were, there were trams, tracks here. Um, along this main road and along this road, yeah, one, two, three, four, five. Seven houses, maybe eight houses. Sometimes the text is just hiding a little house, I guess. And uh, here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Here you can see a lot of houses. I'm going to count the houses in this area to the northwest, named uh, Shelby. I wonder if this could be, because Vik is Bay, I wonder if this could be the Bay, the name referred to, or if it could be probably this one, because here is where the label is. The island of Stora Essingen, uh, greater, lesser. And this is Lilla Essingen. see some bigger houses. These were very modern at this time, 1930s. Houses for more than one family.
think this is supposed to be trees, but not like every tree, but symbol for a road uh, surrounded by trees. Um, these type of buildings are like town, center or city, with the square blocks. Here we have some very small houses. See if I can count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. found this video relaxing and uh, see you soon show you these um, flowers or in fact these are Swedish uh, traditional pins charity pins that you can buy in April and May each year every year
brochures that I got, some folders. When you were in school, actually, you got a lot of information from about uh, my blooman, as these are called, Mayflower, because um, it's uh, kids who are selling these through the school. So. And um, The profit also goes to kids in need, so it's uh, children helping children, that's the idea of it. But I must say, I didn't care much about the the charity aspect of it as a kid. I just liked to collect and uh, to look at these um, these kinds of um, cards where you could see how the flowers look like for each year and I never had a complete collection but uh, I think actually I had the third one that was my oldest in my collection from 1909 see every flower from 1907 to 2007. It's 101 different color combinations, different styles. Here you can see all the flowers from 1907 to 1957 and on the back here you can see from 1958 to 1995. You can see that some years there are two variations even though I actually can't see any difference these uh, two from 1964 or from 1965 or from 1973 they look um, identical to me 1966 I could see slightly where you can see more significant differences, variations. Here you can see the center, color of the center, the flower, completely different color. And on this one, 1942, you can see that um, one variation still has this um, center, three-dimensional center of glass, and uh, the other variation, there are a flat center made of paper, and uh, the following years, they Here you can 
see all the flowers from 1907 to 1991 from 1907 to 1988 some information about the summer camp where children in need or from maybe ill children or uh, children from uh, low income families they got the chance to spend some time in the summer So a fantasy flower added from 1724. It's not a real one, it's just and it, I haven't noticed this one, it's from 1618 actually. This one it looks like uh, real flowers. see some text added it's the year when Hershey was born from 1907 to 1981 Here's um, Peter Halberg born in 1869 and dead of this idea. And um, here are the flowers from 1907 to 1977.
most the most recent one. It's uh, all the flowers from 1970. You can see this is uh, the flower from 1970. If you compare, find it here. It's a red uh, petals and a green center. information about the history here's the prototype that Pieta Halberg found somewhere and then she got the idea to make a flower a pin look like this here's the first That's just decoration. I don't know why you should uh, just show the flowers from 1913 and 1919. Otherwise, this is from a magazine. Here you can see they are selling similar flowers in Denmark and uh, Norway. There are ladies from all those three Nordic countries are, are on the same photo with the flags. Norway, Sweden, no Danish flag. So I guess this is uh, Bjeda Halberg, the middle. Oops. It's falling apart. Um, 
also says uh, some interesting about the US. The idea was to export it to the US as well. And um, uh, it says here that. a hospital in Colorado, in Denver, from the money they collected selling the, these paints. And uh, I guess it's from the beginning it was a hospital for, for the Swedish Americans who had Cents, it says here. And they were produced produced in the Providence, except for 1927 and 1931, when when they were imported from Gothenburg. And uh, a new hospital was uh, built in 1931, got the name Maiblumann. It was uh, mostly for people suffering in tuberculosis. And then when um, Tuberculosis no longer was a huge problem. A couple of years later it was changed the name to Swedish Medical Center in It says dark cobalt blue made of celluloid, three layers. Uh, center made of glass in amber color. So that's the first one. It's really rare, I think. This first one is much rarer than the rest. I 
guess there weren't so many produced, but uh, since it was such a success, already in 1908, there were a lot of more of these produced. Also, I think this was only in Gothenburg, and um, from 1908 they were sold all over Sweden, and also other countries. Now I have told you a little about this and um, actually what I would like to show you now is how I use this information today because I still keep thinking of these flowers every now and then and um, I noticed that uh, it has become a way become a way for me to memorize things to memorize numbers because when I was a kid I learned I studied these, uh, all these uh, different colors and shapes and materials so accurate. Spent so many hours on this. And when you're a kid, you like learn for the rest of your life. So, so I have noticed that uh, I can quite immediately combine a two-digit number to one of these flowers. So if you skip 19, because they all, almost all of them starts with 19. 19. So here you have 24, 25, 26. So when I hear a number with two digits, then I don't have to think. I just see this flower, I feel it. And I mean 24 and 35 looks quite similar perhaps at first glance, but um, actually there is a difference. Here you can see green color actually green sepals. If you turn it around you can see the turned green sepals and um, 35 there are no green sepals on the back. Also 1944 or let's call it just That's how you can tell the difference from one year to another, if you studied them carefully. But for example, if I have to memorize a code, pin code, four digits, then I just have to think about combination of two of these flowers. Forty 
says well, zero 04 I don't see this flower immediately before my eyes I somehow can have forgotten it or I have to think before I see it I think I can see if you have something else that you have collected or have been really interested in as a kid that include numbers you can use that instead because now I started to think about math Some of you don't find maths relaxing at all, but then you can just uh, you can just uh, listen, and you don't have to feel that you need to memorize or understand this at all. So I hope you can just uh, find this relaxing. Maybe fall asleep. I started to think about some constants in math, some small numbers, where it's important, it makes a big difference if uh, the decimals aren't right. For example, pi, 3.14, or An even smaller number, square root of 2. I don't know exactly square root of 2, but square root of 2, 1.4. say this is almost like 1.5 but uh, if you calculate using 1.5 when there should when it
it's supposed to be square root of 2, then the calculations get, get really strange after a while, I think. So when it's small numbers, it's quite uh, important that you use accurate decimals. So that's when I come up th with the idea to memorize some of these numbers, constants that you that you stumble upon a lot if you if you are doing maths. And uh, I would like to try to remember these and memorize these. And I will use this method, like I said. See if you can help me. But I will. Since I can only remember two digits, or I mean two decimals, that's uh, that's uh, the, the limit for me. So I'm not going to try to learn pi in more than two decimals, or any other of the numbers. So let's start with pi. Um, Decimals, it's 3.14. And I won't forget that uh, pi is 3 point something. So let's just remember it's 14. So this flower. I guess um, it could be like a dandelion or something. I don't know what, what flower this is supposed to be. I know this is a daisy. Then it's a yellow daisy shaped flower. In the beginning, there were actually some flowers um, resembling real flowers. So, this is. I uh, have to check the English name. It's a heart seas or wild pansy. This is a rose, and this is the, the wood anemone, the blue anemone. And this strange flower here is a violet. When I was a kid I thought this was the most ugly of the mayflowers. thought it looked like a puffball. Symmetric and brown. Didn't like it. Um, yeah, and the daisy here, and this yellow flower that I refer to as a, as a dandelion. But let's go on with some more. again, but pi over 2. That's uh, 1.57. Then I will remember 57 for pi over 2. 57 is the first uh, flower made of plastic. These were made of paper. And then these were made of celluloid, the old type of plastic. These were celluloid as well. These were uh, fabric. These were made of paper. The celluloid ones, I guess, are very flammable. I read somewhere that celluloid can like start to fire of itself somehow. 
I don't know how that works, but mm-hmm. yeah, the plastic era starts here from fifty-seven, and there are plastic until ninety-seven. Then it's they are made of paper again, thick paper here, and then. Let's memorize. Pi times two. That's six point twenty eight. So that's uh, twenty eight. This is one of the flowers I really I remember. I really liked. one point oh five if we only count the first two decimals Six 
zero point fifty two. on this picture, but that's how I remember it. And um, pi, five pi over six, that's 2.62. Here we have 62, also a very dark blue, but this time plastic flower and a yellow sand. Looks almost black at this, this um, picture. As in the beginning, they used to have blue flowers every five years. So every year ending with the seven, because it was celebrated the like 20 year celebration, 30 year celebration, 40 year celebration, 50 years, 60 years, and so on. And also every year ending with a two. So um, this was 60, then this is 55 year celebration, and 45 year celebration, 35 year celebration, and there 100 celebration also, yellow flower, <laughs> sorry, uh, blue flower. is 2.72 it's quite important to know because it's as important as pi so
a natural logarithm of 2 0 0.69 some square roots now. Square root of 2 is 1.41. So it's this one. square root of 2 over 2. That's 0 0.71. 71 is this purple plastic flower.
then we have 0 0.87. second part of the video and if you haven't uh, watched the first part yet I recommend you to do so because otherwise you might start to wonder what I'm doing um, but um, I'll put the link in the description so it's one hour first part and the reason this video turned out into two parts is that I noticed the recording uh, time turned out really long the footage so it was uh, over two hours then I decided to to split it into two uh, parts but um, I didn't intend to do like a start a new series or anything, it's just, just these two parts. But um, since um, I realized I was going to upload a second uh, part of it, I decided to do a new introduction as well. I realized that I had been talking about these uh, flowers, my bluma, or mayflower. In Swedish it's called my bluma. It means mayflower. I've talked for two hours about this without showing one single one. So, of course I have to do that. You can see the size and the shape of it. This is the flower from 19... I'm sorry, this is a flower from this year, 2018. So it's made of paper. It's a pin, needle that is bent like this and um, center here two layers of the petals two different colors at least on this one You can see 2018 compared to all the other 111 flowers from the past. Also, I think it would be nice to show you each flower more detailed. be 
before we start uh, with the video again. We start from 1907, so we go through all the years. Maybe you can remember somehow your own year when you were born, perhaps. To try to remember the color combination of that particular flower. Only if you want to, of course. But since there are, there's one flower for each year. That's something you could do. So, 
This was um, 87. Square root of 3 over 2. Now, let's take more square root. doesn't have any decimals, but square root of 5, 2.24. Here we have a 24. It's actually the first flower with the modern shape and size. These were a bit larger than they are today and these were, like I said, mentioned before, resembled real flowers and these are very big, but from 1924 until today they have always been this shape and size. shades of green and the yellow center. I guess when it's a yellow center you don't really have to think about it because the majority of all these flowers has yellow center. So at least I do like that. I only memorize when it's not the yellow center. Then you can distingu distinguish for example this one, 75, from 
six because uh, seventy-five has a red center, and so on. Now I almost forgot what our last memorized decimal was. It was square root of seven. It was two point sixty-five. And let's take square root of eight. Two point eighty-three. Here's eighty-three. It's green center. It's a very unique color, the off-white front petals and the yellow back petals. I don't think this off-white has been used another year. Square root of nine is three, so there's no no decimals there. But uh, let's take a last square root. I don't know if this is a common number in maths, but uh, the square root of ten. Let's take that one. So it's a bit more than three. It's three point sixteen. square roots. I think we can add some more some more small numbers here and um, I would like to memorize some fractions. If we start with the most basic one, 1 over 2, we get 0 0.5. Not a big surprise. But that's 0 0.50. So it's this green one with the with the white edges that I mentioned before. And the yellow center and made of paper. And um, one over three. Another small number, zero point three three. It's uh, 0 0.33. Then I will memorize this yellow celluloid flower with the white center of glass. The early years, I think, all the time there were no yellow centers was um, in the cases where there were yellow petals because for some reason I think yeah, yeah. here you can see all yellow flowers 1909, 1922, 1914, 1925 but after that it's like uh, there are yellow centers until there's a uh, yellow, all yellow flower, then the center is changed to another color. The same here, the same here, the same here, not here, but here, and here, and here, and here, 
lovely. So sometimes it was, uh, it looks like there was a problem to have all, all the, the flower, all the parts of it uh, in the same color, and sometimes it wasn't. Mm. Let's go on with the uh, Where, where it's uh, where it's shaped like uh, like most of the of the Mayflowers, but uh, it's like one the the back uh, layer is missing for some reason. Yeah, the first fractions here was uh, quite easy to remember, but. This one too, one, one over five, that's zero point two. So it's this one, the violet. That looks more brown to me, but and um now it's getting a bit more difficult to remember, at least for me. So one over six that zero point one six 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 or zero point one seven zero point seventeen and we will remember this rose naturalistic This is not a number that I remember immediately, so it's good to try to learn to memorize it. It's 0 0.14. Actually, we already have a number to remember for 14, and that's pi, 3.14. But I think it's a good coincidence because um, historically there there's a fraction number that you sometimes use to get as close to pi as uh, I mean I for an approximation because there are no way to write it pi exactly so you always have to use approximations and one common approximation is. 22 over 7. That just sounds strange to me, but if you instead say 3 and 1 over 7, or 3 and 1 seventh, then it makes more sense, I think, because then you have the same same uh, two decimals for that approximation and for pi itself. To me it makes sense. So makes it easy to remember. 1 over 7, that's 0 0.17. Sorry, 0 0.14. Um, Let's take 1 over 8, and that's another exact number, 0 0.125, but to this system it has to be 0 0.13, so then it's uh, the day C of 1913, that's 1 eighth, and the last one, 
that fraction, let's take 1 over 9. And uh, with two decimals, that would be 0 0.11. start from the beginning. I don't think we had any number here or here. I haven't mentioned these, but uh, this one was connected to a specific decimal number. This was 2 pi over 3. And then it was 2.09. Because uh, pi is uh, not much more than, than 3, just a little bit. And then uh, a third of pi must be uh, just a little bit over one. And I remember that was this one, 1.05. It's good that all these are yellow. Connect them somehow. This is very light yellow. I think the front petals are transparent even. White, transparent and yellow, but uh, overall this is a yellow flower to me. And um, so we have one third of pi, this light yellow. We have two thirds of pi, this uh, yellow. And we have pi, this large yellow. Smallest one, almost fading away to the middle one, to the very large one. That's how I will try to remember it. And here we have another number. Here we have... Uh, it was something connected with this light blue one. And I think these were the natural logarithms. Yeah, and this was uh, the natural logarithm of 2, so e to the power of something that equals 2. That must be less than 1, so that, that was 0 0.69. And um, the natural logarithm of 3 that's the same as e to the power of 
something that is equals to 3 and that must be a little bit more than 1 so it's 1 point 10 that's the national algorithm We have something as well. Eleven, and uh, that was the smallest fraction. If if we would have more fractions, they would just be smaller and smaller until zero here. So that's not so important. But this was the last fraction we we included, and that's one over nine. 0 0.11 here we have nothing here we have something and that's um, the next to last uh, fraction it's 1 over 8 0 0.13 here we have pi 3.14 and also Uh, the fraction 1 over 7, that's 0 0.14, also used as an approximation, 3 plus 1 over 7, an approximation of pi. Here we have nothing, here we have something. We have... Uh, was the square root of yeah square root of 10 I think the square root of 10 must must be 3 and uh, a little bit larger than 3 bigger than 3 so 3.16 could be the square root of 10 and here we have something as well and um, this is 1 over 6 that's uh, 0 0.17 something I'm not sure what yet um, it's a square root of uh, it's the first square root for uh, an integer over I mean bigger than 4 so it's square root of 5 square root of 4 that's 2.0 so that's no decimals but square root of 5 that's 2.24 and we have 1 over 4 that's 0.25 
3.14 times 2, that's 6.28. These are connected uh, in that way that you double the last two digits here. Nothing special here. Oh, this looks like it's almost falling apart. The celluloid material is very fragile. I think it's quite um, common that these uh, petals are like, like they're falling off. You can see a lot of, of uh, uh, species of these. Of, uh, see a lot of flowers where they're not complete. Thirty-three. Yeah, of course. That's uh, one over three. Zero point. That's zero point thirty-three. Here we have nothing special. Here we have something. is a long chain but uh, pi was there pi over 2 must be 50 and a little more must be yeah 57 it must be. and if we take half of that we get Six I think this is um, pi over 4, 0 0.79 and uh, 2 pi over 4 that must be 
high. Over 4, that must be 57 plus 6, 79. What's that? That's 36. Yeah, it is 36. 0, 1, 2. So it's 2.36. And that's 3 pi over 4. This was the most difficult one so far. Not very immediately memorized. But uh, it's good, it's a connection somehow between 1 over 1 fourth and 3 fourth. They're, they're both green with the yellow center. The 79 and the 36. I'm trying to connect this in my mind somehow. something. We have a square root again. So it's the first square root since uh, this one, so it's a uh, square root of 6. And that's 2.45. Mm, let's go on and see what we have. Nothing special. And here's the most uh, most uh, the easiest to remember. It's uh, one over two, zero point fifty. And no, I'm not sure. No. I don't something here. Yeah, we, we had something here. We had um, uh, Yeah, we had the half of uh, pi m over 3, so it's pi over 6. It's just a little bit more than 0 0.5. 0 0.52. If we double it, we get 1.05. And if we triple that one, we get 3.14. So it's the uh, smallest fraction that we mention here of pi, pi over 6. 0 0.52.
007 times 2 is 0 0.42. It's quite easy to remember if you know pi. And nothing here. Nothing here. 62. Definitely something here. the the pi fraction here as well it was the five pi over six somehow so we had uh, pi over six here and if we take that six times fifty two times six also good that these two are dark blue. 1 over 6, uh, pi over 6 and 5 pi over 6. You can have both these in mind when it comes to We have something here, 65. Yeah, it's another square root. So we have had a square root of 5, of 6, and now it's a square root of 7. That's 2.65 square root of 7. Decimals. I mean, twenty hundreds between these square roots, almost from zero for square root of four to twenty four to forty five. But for 71, we have to remember something. And, um, could that be, if we 
double it, we get square root of 2 here, so if we take square root of 2 over 2, square root of 2 over 2, that's uh, 0 0.71. Here we have something as well, and uh, that's one of the important constants, just like pi, you have to remember or memorize the number e, two decimals, or you don't have to, uh, I used to say that to myself, because that's the project right now at the moment for me in this video. So the number e, that's 2.72. the square root of 3 and if 1.41 was the square root of 2 then I guess 1.73 is the square root of 3 because if you take 1.73 to the power of 1.73 no, sorry, 1.73 times 1.73, you should get almost, you should almost double it, so, but uh, a little less than double it, so, 17, 34, yeah, 3.4, but not less, less than 3.4, then you get 3. So square root of 3, that's 1.73. Nothing here. And here we have pi over 4. We already A look on that at zero point seventy nine. And if we triple that one, we get two point thirty six. If we double it, we get one point. This one, eighty three. I guess we don't have so much left now. We have three, we have a square root of three over two. So if we take one point seven to three over two, then we get. not correct. Then it must be the next square root. The last one was at 65. It was 2.65. That was the square root 
something here and here I started to shake it here already but uh, it wasn't right it was a, this is a square root of 3 over 2 if square root of 3 is 1.73 then half of that is 0. anything on the 90s, did we? And there. We already mentioned it, but something to do with this one. And this one. So I guess it's pi over 3, and that's 1.05. was actually real. 
another challenge. 0.71, okay. This was actually a challenge as well. Zero point seven one point forty one. Zero point seventy one and uh, one point seventy three. I also wanted to show you a way of memorizing things if you have if you have something similar, some interest, some nerdy interest that you spent a lot of hours just thinking about, just um, reading, learning about. You can use it, perhaps, for something else that you need to remember, memorize. listening to the history of Mayflower, Swedish Maiblomat.
just to read something here from the book. This is Piata Alberi, a small Piata from Adam. He planned to get the fruit of a to say till Madame Sidon Swans from Mayuna. Otroligt elegant av Och det kostade 25 öre varvet Att få dansa med henne Helst uppträdde hon som Morpiata från Onsala En Göteborg under många år Fär Gör en helt sammanhang Välkänd och framgångsrik gumma I Beatas korg Liknade den som Skorp Bernardina hade haft Salen. fanns allt märkvärdigt i salen. Vita kragar av alla kulör. Tinappar som gav tröst för alla sorger och bedrövelser i världen. Statt upp och kack. Tolfmanna kraft. Gubba skinn. Och mycket annat i flaskor och burkar med apoteksutskrivna etiketter. När lagret tog slut. Ja, då lyckades hon till och med sälja gamla papperspåsar. Tio öre. Stycket. Två för 25 öre. Hon var till exempel med om att arrangera rotarnas festtåg på ett långt drag. Och kunde som vanligt entu- entusiasmera alla antingen. Det gällde att klä ut sig till präst. Bestyra med hästar och vagn. Den sociala medansvar som Fredrik Ström talade om förde Beda Halberg i början av 1890-talet i kontakt med den frivilliga fattigvården i Göteborg. Som medlem i allmänna hjälpföreningen fick hon de kyrkoförsamlingens tredje krets som sitt distrikt genom en bevarad vårdare journal. På början 1906 kan man följa hennes hembesök och Journalanteckningarna blir ofta skakande sociala tidsdokument. Hon berättar om 61-åriga enkan Emma Andersson som klarar sitt uppehälle genom att tillverka och salda buketter av färgade strå och blad i det rum och kök hon hyr för 17 kronor i månaden. Har hon en eller ett par inneboende på en rikt äckenskap med en alkoholist var det Kla Holmberggren söder för ganska ansvarig för barnens försörjning. Hon lyckades också få dem till tugande människor. Men alltid när de stod då i målet att själva kunna hjälpa till kom döden. Och så har det gått undan för undan. Nu återstår bara ett av de åtta barn. 74-åriga enkan Brita Maria Larsson och hennes två fosterbarn. 9 och 10 år bor i ett litet spisrum vid Carl Gustavsgatan. Det fuktar där så gränslöst att hela väggen är och våta och gumman berättade för mig att ofta händer att dörren måste ha grannarna bankas upp. Då köll din trädare och isbildning fast fryser dem under nätten. Detta måste inverka skadligt. Gamla är mycket gikt bruken, bruten och barnen får nog krämpor alldeles säkert. Hoppas att en anmärkning länder till hjälp, skriver fru Hörnberg. show you this map or this atlas 
It says here the taxi map or address map of Greater Stockholm. And uh, I just bought this one. I'm really interested in maps of uh, Stockholm or Greater Stockholm. Stockholm is where I live. And I think it's really fascinating to look at historical maps over the surrounding areas. So, for example, if I want to take a biking trip somewhere, it's always so fun to explore not just how it looks today, the area I visit, but also how it used to look in the past and uh, look for clues and uh, traces and old buildings and such things. And this one was actually a very beautiful book, I think. Nice texture. So the letters here are like um, a relief, so you can feel, even if you close your eyes, you can kind of read, touching the letters like this. So here we have an eye. I'm closing my eyes now. It's not very easy. The R, perhaps? And also, I know what it says. So, the T here. The A. The N. said, uh, I'm still closing my eyes, uh, ad address carton, but these letters are smaller and not as easy to, to, to feel the shape, and then I guess it says, Should have an S here somewhere. T O no. Quite lost now. L or K, perhaps H, maybe. And here we have an O. This is how it feels. O L. Oh. 
しますね。H。スミス。タイアグラ。I can't figure out what letter I have. Has this diagonal? Can it be the S? Maybe it is an S. T O C. Yes, it is. K. Stockholm. Sure at all. Okay, I'll open my eyes. Yeah, it says over, of course, over, greater, ever, stor. When I had closed my eyes, I somehow looked for just the letters S, G, O, R. I forgot this word, over. You can see that this、uh, book is from 1964, and、um, here's the index section. Starting with A, B, C, D, E, F. I think it's really beautiful. This.、Um, Lines that、uh, like moves downwards like this. G. Addresses or streets starting with the letter Q in Greater Stockholm at this point. S. S is a very common starting letter, as you can see. Also have it in the city itself. Stockholm. Also in the word for greater. Stor. T. 
see you be the three last letters from the Swedish alphabet. Three additional vowels. O. listed street name in this index is Överskärar Gränd page 50 Överskärar Gränd To look it up. Fifty. That's the very last page, probably. Oh, there is an uh, fifty. Ah, uh, I see. It's in the old town. It's in the very center of the city. So the, the last map. In this atlas is um, like a zoomed in map of the old town in Stockholm. And the old town is in the very center where we have the royal castle and um, the old church and a lot of old churches. So this this was basically the whole city in medieval times. So B two. It's an old, um, like, old title for someone, for like a job. I will uh, take a look here in Google Translate. creating clothes cut the fabric then someone who was doing this as a craft as a job they were called over cutter over at 
think a lot of the small streets here in the old town have like names. Yeah, here, Skreddar. Skreddare, Taylor. Taylor are like uh, old um, titles and for crafts, various crafts. Yeah, here we have Skomaka Grand, Shoemaker, or Cobbler. So my idea for today's video was to just show you Examples of streets from this book. And um, I think it's really nice that it's uh, the Greater Stockholm and that, that it's uh, that it is showing the I mean the greater Stockholm, not just the center of Stockholm. There are so many maps of just the center of a city. But this one, because it's for taxi drivers, is uh, you can find detailed maps over the entire area. And of course today it's no problem to find these kind of maps on just Google Maps or OpenStreetMap or anything. But from 1964, I think it's quite rare to find, and uh, it's nice to to have the names of the streets labeled. What the, the streets were called in 1964. Of course, a lot of them still have the same names today, but a lot of them also don't. And there were not a lot of motorways and freeways at this point. They had just started to build those types of roads, so there are old... Uh, the old roads are still the main roads at this point. So this is the northern part. Legend, and you will see there are a lot of planned roads. They had started to plan a lot of motorways. Some of them were not uh, realized. I mean, they were not uh, completed, or just they they stopped as a just a plan. In the nineteen sixties, there were a lot of traffic. Planning for for car traffic. Main road. This white orange lines. Railroad black and subway or tram. boundaries for cities and this light blue dotted dashed line something I'm really interested in as well the boundary for recreation areas nature, reserves and such things. And yeah, since this is a taxi map, this uh, blue star label here is station for taxi. 
avatars. These black roads are stairs or other type of um, stops. I mean, you can't drive on those with a car. So they are uh, marked here, quite visible. So taxi drivers knew yeah, they couldn't pass that road. Here we have the southern part of Greater Stockholm. So it's not just the, the city of Stockholm, also the, the bordering um, municipalities or communes. They are their own cities, with their own city rights, I guess. So we have the border for actual Stockholm here at this point. So this is Stockholm. This is Nacka, this is Tyresö, this is Österhaninge, this is Huddinge, Botkyrka, Ekerö, you can see it says kommun, that means uh, Commune or municipality. Uh, we have Bo, we have Lidinge, Stocksund, Jusholm. here that there are at this map there are a lot of a lot more of these adjacent cities their own cities um, because it's from 1964 and I know that in 1971 there were a lot of reorganization and there were a lot of these uh, municipalities uh, sur surrounding Stockholm were merged into bigger uh, entities. They were like united. So yeah, Saltsjöbaden also uh, was here, its own city. Today's Altkabaden and Bu are both part of Nakka, for example. And uh, also I know that Stocksund and Jusholm are today part of parts of Tanderit. And also 
So I know that fanning, sir, is today part of Yekira Komen. Yeah, now I actually got an idea. I would like to choose an area where the names of the streets, or the, I mean the streets are named after um, Old Norse mythology characters. Because I've noticed that there are a lot of areas around Stockholm where you can find those types of names. Uh, for example, Odin, Thor, Tyr, Frey, those uh, deities from Old Norse mythology. So they have named streets in various places all around Sweden, I guess, but in Stockholm there are also a lot of places where you suddenly stum stumble upon those names again and again. So let's say, for example, Tyr. I think Tyr is a, is a character from Norse mythology, but now I have to check. It's not the most common one. Tyr. Asir goddess in Nordic mythology. Uh, no, not goddess. Uh, god. Uh, Asir god. Son of Odin. And the god of war. His weapon is the sword. Yeah, he's a warrior. Tyr. Let's see if we can find his streets. So we have Tyrgatan. Tyr Street. I guess it's in... No, it doesn't say where it is. Which area? Page 22. Then we have Tyrvägen in Bo. And also a Tyrvägen in Ljusholm. Let's start with those two. Let's start with Tyrvägen, Ljusholm. 11 and A18. Okay, so here we have a lake, Ekeby Lake, and a small beach for swimming. By this lake, and uh, it looks like there are some wetlands um, surrounding it, like a marsh type of landscape. We have a park, Ekeby Park. So it's in the area called Ekeby. We have 
have a station here, a railway station called Jusholms. It can be stop, stop, like a tram stop or railway stop. Not exactly station, so it's a smaller version of just a sim quite a simple stop. It's in Jusholms city, so that's why the stop is called Jusholms Ekeby, not just Ekeby. Maybe there are other areas called Ekeby around Stockholm, so to be clear, it was named Jusholms Ekeby. And here we have a road called Tyrvägen. I guess named after this war, war go, uh, god. Here's the station street. And the post office close to the station. I guess you could call it the station. Here we have Old Ekeby. So I guess uh, it's a house, for like a old uh, mansion, or I don't know what type of house it is. It looks quite small. Okay, yeah, here we have Ekeby. This is probably a bigger mansion or something. And this is even older than that one. Old Ekeby. So, I guess these houses have given name to this area. with a lot of streets and uh, houses. Th this orange color means it's there are houses here. People live here. Here we have a road called Friek. Rekevägen. Frodevägen. Ischavägen. Völsungavägen. I'll show you again. Frekevägen. Frodevägen. Ischavägen. Völsungavägen. These names sound quite... not familiar, but... Um, to me it sounds like uh, Old Norse types of names, or very historical Nordic, Swedish names and na uh, like, not names that you hear a lot today, but names you can hear in old myths and sagas and stories from the past, the Vikings era, such things. So, Völsunga, no idea what that is, and I'll take a look here in Google. Völsunga Saga. The Völsunga Saga is a legendary saga, late 13th century poetic rend 
competition in Old Norse of the origin and decline of the Velsum clan, including the story of Sigurd and Brynhild. An example of an heroic saga that deals with Germanic heroic legend. And Frode, who was Frode? Old Myth Kings Like a fairy tale king So it's not uh, like evidence that they have they have actually been a king called that it could be just myth So there are a lot of myths around Frode in those Icelandic Icelandic sagas, I guess. Snorri Sturlasson's work from the Ed Edda from like. thousand years ago something like that it was compiled around 1220 the, the Edda but there were stories in it that had been uh, like an or oral tradition stories so these are really old Viking stories It says that Frode should have lived while Caesar Augustus would have been the Roman Emperor. According to myth. The first Roman Emperor from 27 BC to 14 AD Augustus so while he was an emperor in Rome Frode could have been uh, a Danish king okay and here we have Irsha, Isha Vägen. Isha is actually a name not super uncommon, I think, female name. It derives from uh, Old Norse word that has to do with the Ursus, that means Bear. And uh, the word could also have something to do with the word ir. Ir. Dizzy. Or the wild one. So it's a, it's a girl's name I used today as well. But it has uh, Old Norse origins. And Freke. I don't think I've ever heard Freke, but it really sounds like 
like an ordinary name to me. Okay, Freki or Freke. We have Geri and Freki in Norse mythology, both meaning the ravenous or greedy one, the two wolves which are said to accompany the god Odin. They are attested in the Poetic Edda, a collection of epic poetry compiled in the 13th century from earlier traditional sources in the Prose Edda, written in the 13th century by Snorri Sturlason and in the poetry of skalds. Okay, so it's a, a pair here. It's a Geri and Freki. The pair has been compared to similar figures found in Greek, Roman and Vedic mythology and may also be connected to beliefs surrounding the Germanic Germanic wolf warrior bands, the Ulf Hedner. The names Geri and Freki have been interpreted as meanings either the greedy, greedy one, or the ra ravenous one. The name Geri can be traced back to the Proto Germanic adjective. Keras, attested in Burgundian Kirs, Old Norse Ker, and Old High German Ker, or Kiri, all of which mean greedy. The name Freki can be traced back to the Proto Germanic adjective Frekas, attested in Gothic. Old Norse frekr means greedy. Old English freck Des uh, desirous, greedy, gluttonous, audacious, and old high German fre means greedy as well. John Lindo interprets interprets both Old Norse names as normalized adjectives. Bruce Lincoln further traces Kerry back to Proto Indo European stem Ker, which is the same as uh, the found in Camr, a name referring to the hound closely associated with the events of Ragnarok. I don't know if you have heard about Ragnarok. Yeah. So that was interesting. There's a word here I would like to look up. Uh, ravenous. What does that mean exactly? Ravenous, okay. Extremely hungry. Mm -hmm. Klupsk. In Swedish. Klupsk. 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 If someone is very klupsk. Klupsk. This person is extremely hungry and can't stop eating. Klupande. Another Swedish name.
Okay, so we have a lot of Nordic mythology in Yusholm's Erkebi, as you can see. And now... Let's look up Tyrvägen in Bo. 27 P B 42 strange name actually can't think of any word other word right now in Swedish uh, with two letter O after each other it's more common in English I guess Boo. if you drop one O we have just boo that means to inhabit so here we have a little small lake Tresk Tresk is actually like marsh but it's a small pond Sarv Tresk Sarv here we have Hasseludsvägen an area called Nybacka and uh, this area today is uh, very different the late 1960s and uh, early 1970s I guess a completely new area was built here so there are the landscape has changed has changed dramatically since since this point it's an area called Orminge Now we will try to find Tyr Vägen. Here it is, Tyr Vägen. And uh, also in this area I immediately notice a lot of uh, old Norse related names here Nimrodsvägen Idunvägen Åsastigen Lokevägen Loke is a really famous God, Norse mythology, Osa is actually a very common girl's name, a woman's name, but I know it has uh, also 
Old Norse origin. Nor, nor old Nordic name. It's not also it's not very common to have names starting with the letter O. The very typical for Swedish letter, not in many other alphabets. There are some names starting with O. Åke is a, is a male name, Åsa is a female name. Um, Nimrod, I want to look up Nimrod. I've forgotten who that is or what it is. Ah, this is not. This is a uh, Bible from the Bible. Biblical mm, has something. I can read about the Tower of Babel. Nimrod, I thought it it, uh, it sounded very Nordic. Maybe I just mixed that up. Biblical fig figure, according to the book of Genesis and book of Chronicles. The son of Cush. Nimrod was also described as a king in the land of Shinar in Mesopotamia. The Bible... states that he was a mighty hunter before the Lord and began to be mighty in the earth. Extra-biblical traditions associating him with the Tower of Babel led to his reputation as a king who was rebellious against God. This article is about the biblical king for other uses, see Nimrod. Yeah, but it must be this Nimrod. I guess. But this uh, street is referred to, the name of this street. Don't you think? Historians have failed to match Nimrod with historically attested figures. Nimrod may not represent any one personage known to history, and various authors have identified him with, uh, with uh, several real and fictional figures of Mesopotamian antiquity, including the Mesopotamian god Ninurta, or the conflation of the two Akkadian kings Sargon, his grandson Naram Sin, and uh, Tukulti Ninurta, 1243 to 1207 BCE. Yeah, so this is a really, really old uh, figure from old Mesopotamia origins, possibly from that time and that culture. It's really interesting. And here we have Eden. Eden. In Norse mythology, Eden is a goddess associate, associated with apples and youth. Eden is attested in the Poetic Edda, compiled in the 13th century from earlier traditional sources, and the Prose Edda written in the 13th century by Snorri Sturluson. In both sources she is described as the wife of the skaldic god Bragi, and in the Prose Edda also as a keeper of apples, 
and grantor of eternal youthfulness. Now I start to think about the Greek myth where someone is guarding apples, golden apples. That also is part of the the stories about Heracles. Who was that? Heracles, 11th labor, the apples of the Hesperides, Hes Hesperides, 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 I'm not sure how to, how to pronounce it really, Hesperides, perhaps. Brage is a skaldic god of poetry in Norse mythology. According to some sources, Luke is the son of Far Pauti. Yeah, that's a Jotun, like a giant. And uh, Laufe, mentioned as a goddess. And the brother of Helblindi. Helblindi. And um, Bileister. Loki is married to Sigun and they have a son, Narfi and Nari. Or maybe it's the same person. By the Jotun Angroda. Ang Angroda. Loki is the father of Hel. Hel, the wolf Fenrir. And the word ser word serpent Jormungandr. Loki in the form of a mare was impregnated by the stallion Svad Svadilvari. Yeah, uh, Loki is a mother as well, yeah. It's a very strange myth. He's a mother of a horse. So he gave birth to the eight-legged horse Sleipnir. Loki is referred to as the father of Vali in Prose, Prose Edda, though this source also refers to Odin as the father of Vali twice. And Vali is found mentioned as a son of Loki only once. Yeah, there are a lot of myths, interesting, strange, fun myths about Loki. I read some of them. could be translated as Tyr Street 22 A 
Yeah, here we have small, really small street here, Tyrgata. I didn't know it existed actually, but it's in the center of Stockholm. Close to Odin, Odin Street. That's a really big main street, named after the great god, most famous, uh, one of the most famous gods. Odin. Also we have Frigagatan, Sjöldungagatan, Baldersgatan. So a lot of Nordic of the Norse names here. Close to the eastern railway station in Stockholm. I think that was everything for today. Maybe I can continue to take, to read a bit from this atlas. I also ordered another atlas from 1944. But I haven't got it yet. But then we could like compare areas, streets, names. from these two years, two different years in the history. No. Can you see that it's like three-dimensional here? You can relief shape, or I mean relief. Somehow. Store. Stock. Hall. Thank you so much for watching, sleep well, see you soon, take care, stay safe. show you this two piece card with this sleeve here showing a map of Sweden This is an old card, I don't know from where, but it says Speed Oil. Pliven med er motor. Speed Oil vid varje tankning.
speed oil i bensin so i guess this must have been a ad or like a giveaway from the gas station speed oil i haven't heard about in Sweden the biggest towns I guess and what you can do with this with these two parts is that you could calculate the distance between two places So here it says Hur långt från And then there's a window Till Någon av städerna på kartan Räknat i kilometer So how long from are just blank but if I pull this a little bit down then the first city appear here Stockholm and then suddenly a lot of numbers have appeared here and in Stockholm it's just a to Stockholm is nothing when you are in when you already are in Stockholm as it says here but if you would go from Stockholm to Gävle it would be 182 kilometers to Falun it's 200 
so we go back to Stockholm and if we travel to the south we have Norrköping at the coast, the east coast and to Norrköping it's 175 Helsingborg from Stockholm is 608 kilometers. And the Swedish word for kilometer is kilometer. So from now on I use the word kilometer. distance is when you take the road through Gothenburg or if it's another road here through Värmland. So that was all the distances from Stockholm to all these places in Sweden. And then if you pull this card just a little bit you will see it says Göteborg here and um, like I said that's the second biggest city in Sweden so I guess it's the order in which they are listed here it's it's uh, the list of how big the city is. So from uh, from Gothenburg, we can. 
and start to measure some distances here and in Gothenburg we have this black round dot just pointing out that there's the city that we are right now imagining and if we would go to Oslo in Norway then there will be 341 kilometers south, along the south, along the west coast, and then we'll reach Helsingborg, and to Helsingborg it will be 248 kilometers, and we continue down to Malmö, second largest city, uh, the third largest city, to Malmö it's 301 kilometer and we continue to the most southern town in Sweden it's Ystad then it's 372 kilometer supposed to be the most southern part of Norland. Norland is the northern part of Sweden. It's called Norland, the Northland. And actually I don't think this map is is completely accurate because I think it stretched a bit, so 
the southern part of Sweden is a bit larger here on this map than than it is in reality compared to the northern part. The northern part is a bit larger, taller. But I guess it's just a way to make this map be more readable because there are a lot of more big towns. There's a big bigger population in the southern Southern, southern part of Sweden than in the northern part. So I think it's a town here called Hudiksvall. It's um, here somewhere and that should be in the middle of Sweden. Yeah, maybe it is. Maybe I was wrong there. Okay, so we continue to measure and calculate the distance to from Göteborg to the north of Sweden. So if we would go to Östersund, it's 895 kilometers. And if we would like to visit Hennesand, then it would be almost the same actually as Östersund, but it in another direction. So it would be 893 kilometer. And then if we move far to the north, we will reach Umeå. After 1146 kilometer and we would reach Luleå after 1451 kilometer and we will reach Haparanda at the very north of Sweden at least at the Swedish east coast it's on the boundary to Finland we will be there after 1603 kilometer. Okay, we go from Göteborg to Malmö. So located here in the very southern part of the country. So from Malmö to Malmö the distance is zero. So it's just a round dot here. But if we would like to move even more south, we can go to Ystad. To Ystad it will be 68 km. And instead of going south, we could go north along the coast and then we would reach Helsingborg after 63 kilometer both Helsingborg and Ystad and Malmö are parts of Skåne the most southern part of Sweden and if we go from Malmö to 
Kerry Huanstan, also in Skwana, but on the eastern coast of Skwana. I think this window here is not exactly located where Kerry Huanstan is more here somewhere, because Skwana is this part of Sweden. It's very distinct shape. And according to this map, Kristianstad wouldn't be a part of Skåne, but it is, so actually it's here somewhere. But the distance to Kristianstad is 103 km. And the distance from Malmö to Kalmar. We can go to Kalmar by following the coast to the east then is 335 kilometer and if we instead move into the country it would be 220 kilometer before we will reach Växjö And if we would move from Malmö along the west coast up to Göteborg, it would be 301 km. And continuing along the west coast and um, across the border to Norway, it would be 642 km to Oslo. from Malmö to Borås it would be 302 km almost the same distance as from Malmö to Gothenburg that was 301 and to Borås in another by taking another road it would be 302 And from Malmö to Norrköping it will be 474 km. From Malmö to Stockholm, the capital city, the distance is 653 km. From Malmö Falun, it's 713 km. And if we go from Malmö all the way to Norrland, on the first town here on the east coast is Gävle, then it will be 786 km. Now the distance is it's getting longer. If we will go further to the north from Malmö to Östersund, it will be 1093 km. And from the Mal from Malmö all the way to Hennesand, it will be 1085. And from Malmö to Umeå, it will be 1353 km. And from Malmö all the way to Luleå, it will be 1638 km. And now I think it will be the longest distance you can see on this map it is from Malmö in the very south to Haparanda in the very north the distance is 1810 km it's quite a long distance from south to north 
if you compare to the distance I showed you before, the west to east distance that was 340 kilometers. So now we have checked all the distances from starting point from the starting point of the three biggest cities in Sweden Stockholm, Göteborg and Malmö and the next city listed here is Norrköping and here you can see Norrköping is located here south of Stockholm but still at the east coast I guess that Stockholm was the fourth biggest town or city in Sweden by the time this was produced this could be from the 1960s maybe I'm not sure now I think that Uppsala, located here, is the fourth biggest town in Sweden. I don't know when you start to call a town a city, but I, I can call Uppsala a town. And um, from Norrköping, the distance to Stockholm is 175 kilometer. It's a bit strange that Uppsala is listed here, but it has no window just the name, you can't see the distance anywhere from Uppsala. From Norrköping to Borås it's 270 kilometer and to Göteborg on the west coast it's 340 kilometer to Oslo in Norway the distance from Norrköping is 523 kilometer and uh, I think Norrköping was not so easy to keep All the windows readable. Um, Norrköping to Kalmar, it's 309 kilometer. To Växjö, it's 281 kilometer. To Kristianstad, yeah, here you can see the distance between these windows. It's not that long, but here you can see to Kalmar it's 309 kilometer and to Kristianstad it's 418 kilometer. So you can see Kristianstad should be more located here. And from Norrköping to Helsingborg it's 429 kilometer. And from Norrköping to Malmö it's 474 kilometer from Norrköping to the very southern tip of Sweden and Skåne it's 510 
is only 63 km and to Easter it's almost doubled it's 112 km and from Helsingborg to Kirikwanstad it's 115 so the distance is almost the same as to Easter where you can see the the distance from the west coast to the east coast it was a it was 347 and now I would like to compare it to Norwich shopping that was 340 kilometer And from Helsingborg to Växjö it's 200 km. From Helsingborg to Göteborg it's 248 km. And from Helsingborg to Oslo it's 500 and 89 km and from Helsingborg to Borås it's 240 km and from Helsingborg all the way to no shipping. It's four hundred and twenty nine kilometer from Helsingborg. 
passing ball to Stockholm. The distance is 608 kilometers from Helsingborg to Falun. You can actually see some roads marked here. Maybe you will use this road to get to Falun. The distance is 668. Kilometer. The distance from Helsingborg to Gävle is seven hundred and forty eight. Sorry, seven hundred and forty one kilometer. And from Helsingborg to Östersund is 1048 kilometer and if you go from Helsingborg to Hennesand it's 1045 kilometer I guess you will use another road maybe this one And from Helsingborg to Umeå, you will just go on from Hennesand and uh, along the coast. You will reach Umeå after 1308 kilometer. And from Helsingborg to Luleå, it's 16. Hundred and thirteen kilometer from Helsingborg all the way to Haparanda. The distance is seventeen sixty five kilometer. And that was all the distances from Helsingborg. And let's see what's the next one. It's Borås. Borås is located here. I guess it's the first city or town that we start to measure the distances from that is not located at the coast, actually. Yeah. No shipping is at the coast, almost at, at the coast. In Malmö, Helsingborg, Göteborg, Stockholm. So now we start from inside the country, it's Borås. And from Borås to Göteborg, the distance is 74 kilometers. quite close. And from Borås to Oslo it's 415 kilometer. From Borås to Helsingborg it's 240 kilometer. From Borås to Malmö it's 302 km and from Borås all the way south to Ystad is 317 km from Borås you go to the south and a little to the east you will reach Kristianstad and that will be 291 kilometer. And from Borås to Växjö it's 215 kilometer. And from Borås to Kalmar there will be 318 kilometer. 
from Boros to Narshaping, it's 270 kilometer. And from Boros to Stockholm, it's 440 kilometer. And from Boros to Falun, it's 465 kilometer. And from Boros to the east coast, to the north, it's Jävle, and that's 533 kilometer. And if we don't go along the coast at all, but go from Poros to Östersund, we will reach there after 700 and 94 kilometer and from Boros to Hennesand it is 860 kilometer from Boros to Umeå it's 1112 kilometer but from Boros to Lulio it's fourteen twenty kilometer and the last one from Boros it's to Haparanda the distance to Haparanda is fifteen hundred and fifty kilometer And Stockholm, Göteborg, Malmö, Norrköping, Helsingborg. One, two, three, four, five. Boros six, and now we are at the seventh biggest town by this time maybe I'm not sure if it doesn't say, say it has to be in that order but I just I'm just guessing it's Javle located here at the southern very southern part of uh, Norland We start to measure the distances to these different locations. And the closest listed here from Jävla is Falun, and that is only 108 kilometer. And um, to Östersund, the distance is 421 kilometer. To Hennesand, then we travel just along the coast, then it's 349 kilometer. And uh, the rest of the towns here are located along the coast, so we just go on. And we'll reach Umeå after 567 kilometer. And we'll reach Luleå after 872 kilometer. And Haparanda. Still over 1000 kilometer. It's Ten hundred and twenty-four kilometers from Jävle to Haparanda, and in the south direction we will reach Stockholm after one hundred and eight 
52 kilometer and north shopping after 335 kilometer Kalmar after 644 km Växjö after 611 km Gävle to Borås The distance is 533 kilometer And from Gävle to Göteborg The distance is 588 km. From Gävle to Oslo, it's 605 km. Okay, let's see so the difference here between Oslo and Göteborg is 12 plus 5 it's 17 okay I guess the distance between Göteborg and Oslo was more than 17 so then it has to be another road here somewhere from Gävle to Oslo um, Gävle to Skåne the four towns and cities here in Skåne we still have to measure so first we have Gävle to Kristianstad and that's 730 kilometer then we have Gävle to Helsingborg 741 kilometer We have Gävle to Malmö, 786 km. And Gävle to Ystad, the longest distance in the southern direction. So that will be 813 km. And I haven't seen this before but Halmstad is also just like Uppsala it's listed here but it has no window so you can't see the distance from Halmstad to these places Halmstad is in between Göteborg and Helsingborg along the west coast I think that's one of the biggest town in Sweden, at least nowadays. It's maybe the fifth or sixth, I'm not sure. Um, the next starting point is Östersund, even more to the north. So we have Östersund here in Jämtland, this area here of Sweden, close to Norway. And from Östersund to Hannesund, the distance is 255 kilometer. And from Östersund to Umeå, it's 427 km. And from Östersund to Luleå, it's 638 km. From Östersund to Eparanda, it's finally not 1000, it's 790 km. And from Östersund to Gävle, it's 421 km. 
from a station to Falun. It's 380 kilometers. And from a station to Stockholm. The distance is 610 kilometers. And from a station to Oslo, it's 804 kilometers. And to Göteborg, it's 895 kilometers. From a station to Borås, it's 794 kilometers. From a station to Norrköping, Distance is six hundred and ninety five kilometer. And from a station to the it's nine hundred and eighteen kilometer. From a station to Kalmar. It's nine hundred and sixty three kilometer. From a station to Kristianstad, it's ten hundred and thirty seven kilometer. These three last windows here is a bit damaged. So there are no windows anymore. There is the to Helsingborg it's 1048 kilometer from the station to Malmö it's 1093 kilometer and from the station to Ystad it's 1140 kilometer so there are still quite a few starting points left here. We have Aparanda, we have Umeå, we have Falun, we have Kalmar, we have Ystad, we have Kristianstad and Hennesand. I think these are enough to make another video for those so it will be like a, like a mini series of this one if you would like to see more so please let me know what you think of this video and um, I also would like to thank you for watching my videos Although I haven't uploaded for quite a while now, I'm so glad you still watch my old videos and that you like them and that you comment and subscribe. So thank you. And uh, I promise there will be some more uploads now. And some map related ones as well. Maybe some map drawing. Okay. Sleep well. Take care. Bye. Hi. Welcome to special. See, I have put up this um, temporary tent of um, blankets over the camera today, and that's because I would like to show you this item. 
actually. I got this from you. Because I decided a couple of months ago that, um, yeah, I noticed I got some um, donations, which was really a surprise. I didn't expect that at all. But I've had some donations from you, and um, that's just incredible. I still can't believe you. You're willing to donate to this channel, so thank you so much. I'm so grateful. And um, I want to give it all back to you, my viewers. I want all the donations go back right back to the channel. So. so this is the purchase from for the first ten donations. And um, of course I want to thank you. Sandy and Mr. T and Tristan and Amy and Alison and Annalisa and um, Callum and um, Noah. And Josh. And Josh again. For your fantastic support you're showing to this channel. And all of you who are writing comments and um, subscribing as well. You're so amazing. Can't believe how much support I get. But um, this is a star globe. see when you turn on the light all the constellations get visible like this these images get visible and today I would like to talk a little about one of these constellations that I find interesting. And it's this one. The Lyra. Lyra. And the story behind Lyra the Greek myth about um, Orpheus and Eurydice, or Eurydice, Eurydice. And it's a myth and a story that I always been find fascinating. It was my favorite story of the Greek stories, or it was actually the only one I could remember from Greek mythology. When I was a kid, I really do 
really captured me. So I want to try to tell you this story today. Because this story, in this story you get the explanations, the explanation to why this image is on the, among the stars, in the sky, the liar. So, I hope you can see. so good at it so even the animals the wild animals became tamed when they heard it even lions and uh, tigers bears they became just calm when they heard his music the animals, every soul on earth. And um, in Greek mythology there were souls even in things like water and uh, rock. So even them, even these, became so charmed and hypnotized almost when Orpheus played on the lyre. And 
when that happened Friedrich fell down of course was very sad and he couldn't he felt he couldn't go on living he had to do something and um, what he did was that he decided to go through the land of the dead the underworld to get everything back from there so he did he tried and with him he brought his lyre but um, no human being had ever visited the underworld and uh, returned it was impossible but the thing was that Orpheus had his lyre beautiful songs so um, Caron the ferry captain helped him cross the river Styx for free just because he played so so beautifully and uh, then the monster the the dog with three heads Cerberus on the other side when he heard the music from the lyre that Orpheus played then he also got calm just like everyone else so Orpheus could pass him to and enter the underworld So we followed the bank, the river sticks, and eventually he entered the the castle. Persephone, the queen of the underworld, and Orpheus asked Hades and Persephone if he could get Eurydice back with him, and he played once again his life, the most beautiful song, and even Hades and Persephone were so charmed and moved by the music, so they said yes could return and he could bring Evridike back but there were one condition he wasn't allowed to turn around while he still was in the underworld he had to 
return, followed by a vritika, but he mustn't. single time, not even once, before they were back at the earth. So they started to walk, and since Evredike now was a dead soul, Orpheus couldn't really tell if it was her that followed him, just by listening or just by touching her hand. And he became so worried that this might be someone else, maybe even not a human. was more and more worried, and he asked, Evridike, is that really you? And Evridike kept saying, yes, it's me. And then Orpheus saw the sunlight at the gate. from the underworld. They were almost back at the earth. But then Orpheus once again felt who is this? Person following me? Is it really Evridike. And he felt he had to look back, turn around, and see if it was really her. So finally he did. And it was Evridike. And Evridike got the most sad expression in her face and said, Orpheus, why did you turn around? Now I have to go back. We can never meet again. And she faded away from him. Back to the underworld. Orpheus had to live his life on earth alone, and he went crazy with grief, but he kept playing music on his lyre, he played the most sad songs you can imagine, about love, lost love. So he went to the Minots, who were some wild women. And when they saw him, they killed him immediately. And Orpheus could finally
didn't bring his lyre it was left on earth and Zeus the god took the lyre and placed it on the sky the night sky like this so that's why we see the star constellation live. And I guess in the underworld, Evridike and Orpheus were somehow happy together. So that was the story that I wanted to tell you. Once again, thank you so much for your support, for the, for the donations. So I could get to this star globe and use it in in my videos and I think I would also like to recommend a couple of YouTube channels that I have just discovered the, these are new channels and the creators have been showing me a lot of support also let me know that uh, this community and uh, even my videos have been as an inspiration for them to start create their new their own ASMR YouTube channels and started to create their own videos and that's so fantastic to hear it's like the best compliment I can get makes me feel really proud, really, that, uh, that you can get that inspiration from my videos. And um, those channels are called, one is called Welsh ASMR82, I will put a link in the description. And um, there you can find some some uh, book uh, book uh, tapping and uh, book uh, page flipping and um, a lot of whispering in many languages. It's Welsh. It's English. It's Mandarin. It's uh, German. far as I have seen. And, uh, yeah, I think it's a really great ASMR channel. The other channel I would like to mention is called uh, Wellbeing ASMR Relaxation. There you can find Mostly non non spoken videos, but some soft spoken. And uh, one vi video I really like is uh, hair playing and uh, hair brushing video. That's really good, really relaxing and uh, calming to watch. So check these channels out. There, just started to upload. And I think there will be really great channels. There already are great. And um, that's all I had for now. Thank you so much for watching.
this group I can use many future videos I think there's a lot of stories behind all these images that you see this was just the first so thank you about maps as you might have noticed most of the maps have been um, very large scale is that the right word or is it a small scale I'm not sure but they have been showing a really big area like a country or a continent or even a planet but today I would like to do something different and I would like to show you a very local map here's the scale, it's 1 to 10,000 so I guess this number is quite small according to other maps 1 meter or maybe 1 uh, centimeter on the map is 10 thousand centimeters in reality and uh, this is an area in Stockholm or actually not in Stockholm but very close to Stockholm I think Stockholm is here to the west and this is called Nacka so it's the city just east of Stockholm but it's not so much considered a city of its own because I mean uh, Stockholm is now a big urban area so it's part of the greater Stockholm in a way but there's an um, interesting area here this is only part of it showing here uh, it's a big old forest area really popular for a lot of different outdoor exercising running biking and, uh, skiing walking yeah so part of the Nacka Reservate, the nature reserve of Nacka and I would like to focus a bit on this very particular area so I'd better zoom in a bit
this summer I have actually spent a lot of time here, this area. And uh, I bought this map and I brought it to this forest and I just love spending time in the forest. Not so much before but uh, something I really have discovered this summer. So I have planned some jogging routes, jogging trails from these different tracks, paths, you can see here. And um, I have planned on the map, drawn on a map, how, how I should run this time. And then when I come home, I maybe change my mind in some details. I think that this was really a challenging slope here, and then I had to to revise it a bit, perhaps. I've tried to find routes that, that are approximately five kilometers long. And um, yeah, I think that would take me like half an hour to travel by running. And um, one thing that I've done is also that I have memorized and I wanted to like learn to navigate on these, uh, these tracks. And it wasn't very easy in the beginning. I, I was lost many times. And when I was lost, I was a bit frustrated. But I must say, I kind of enjoyed being lost for a while. Because uh, it's not that big, this area, so... Somehow I knew that if I just walk in one direction, I will reach a point where I'm not lost any longer. But I realized in this area in the middle, in the center of this area, there are actually no really big tracks. There are just small tracks on this map. It's also a small creek or a brook, you can see here on the map. It's a lot of marshes and bogs. And um, I remember the first time I tried to cross this area and navigate through it, I was completely lost. Came from here, I think, and my plan was to cross it like this, but I ended up here somewhere and was completely lost. But eventually, I finally managed to end up here. I recognized. This big, this big track here, and then I returned home and tried to figure out where I had been during this time. I don't know, maybe 15-20 minutes or so, I had the feeling I was 
was completely lost in the middle of a forest. But I named this part here of the forest, or if I maybe saw it on an old map somewhere. So now it's called the uh, Tarmosan, the pine tree. Swamp or something. So um, it's a track here you can walk and quite easily find. And here, here's a track as well. But uh, all the tracks in uh, Talmosan quite it's quite a challenge to find the right. So, what I did was that I started to plan more in detail and I also, after a while, started to name the places I was uh, passing on my way and I decided to name a place every 100 meter also, it was a good way of keeping track on where I was and how long, how far away I was from from the final five kilometers that would be the total distance of my jogging route. And I can say I was jogging in the beginning because I was just searching and uh, standing still and looking and trying different um, directions and everything like that. Took pictures, uh, trying to remember all the features I saw and that I noticed around me. And and I started to enjoy this labeling process. So now I have two different five kilometer long tracks or trails. And I will start to show you the first one. Um, start from here show you some pictures later, but um, here's actually a big sign where it says start and finish. So it's a good starting point and end point as well. And uh, I guess it's because of this, uh, this is a, a illuminated jogging track or a skiing track in, during winter. couple of kilometers but, um, I found it quite boring to just run on this one so I wanted to discover this part of the forest but I start at the same point here so this is uh, Nedremyren yeah and I should talk about uh, the 100 meter distance Perhaps because um, maybe you're not all very used to meters and kilometers. So if we take a distance here, let's start here. And then we have the distance 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 meters. Seven, eight, nine, ten. One thousand meter. That's uh, one kilometer. And then we have uh, one, two, three, four, five more. Five hundred more meters. 
So this distance here is actually 1.5 kilometer. And um, converting that to feet and miles, then we have for 100 meter we have um, approximately 330 feet. So it's 330, 660, and approximately 1,000 feet. And then we go on. 1,300, uh, 1,600, approximately 2,000. And um, three, six, three thousand, three, six, four thousand, three, six, five thousand. So this is approximately five thousand feet, and that would be approximately one mile, or actually little bit more, so approximately five thousand three hundred feet, something like that. So that's one mile. So my one hundred meter distances is um, equivalent to three hundred and thirty. the total distance of 5 km would be approximately 3 miles, a little bit more. But now I'll start with the labeling. Nedre Myren, the starting point. Diket. Pikuporna. Hundrastgården, Superstenen, Barriären, Skruven, Söderstig, Skrotmossen. Lockstig, Villostigskorset, named after that I was completely lost here the first day because there are tracks in each every direction here. And that's the first kilometer. Kapellstigarna. Söderögla, andra spången, kontrolllåsen, Österbäck, Stupenvägen, Bäckstenstigen. Korsgläntan, Västra Lövsumpen, Stenstoppspasset, Bäckstigen, Dalenstigen, Spikstigen, Dalen, Dalens kors, Edla Dalen, Korvstad, 
now we travel 2.5 kilometers. I forgot the two kilometer stop that was in uh, Bekstigen, Dalingstigen. Let's go on. Sväng trät. Bergbucklarna. Talmoseranden. Prärien. Hitt ut. Norra parat. Ön. Närmare. Klöverdeppan. Cykelberget. And now we are at 3.5 km. Again, I forgot the 3 kilometer stop it was here at the hit it Sykelberget named after all the bikes in this area it's a lot of very popular area for for mountain biking so actually I found it quite uh, useful to look at the the maps they're using and that they're creating for their trails. So it's actually one mountain biking trail here called Fem Svora. It means five really challenging something. Suppose they mean hills, slopes. And uh, here's another mountain biking trail called the Tractor Macht that I found on the websites for, for mountain bike. Tractor Macht it's the power of the tractors. And here's the one called uh, Champs Elysee. So you can really see the tracks the from from the bikes here some places. So here, here we have Sykkel Berget. And um, we go on. Villustigs Korset again. Stensvängen. Lilla svängen. Stora svängen. Mossbron. Here we have the four kilometer stop. So we have one kilometer more to go. Stora stenrondellen. Stenbranten. Solkorset. Perfekta korset. Cykelhöjden. Bäckspången. Svängen, rotstiken, bergknallen and lekberget. It's our five kilometer stop. And then it's just one hundred meters back to Nedre Myren.
really enjoy to label places that I pass. I mean, if I, if it's a if it's a route that I that I walk quite often, I just start to do that almost automatically, I guess. It could be um, a mix of uh, historical, I mean, geographical names is always a mix of historical events that have happened there, or but also like observations from the surroundings and uh, and also help for navigation. Like. Uh, Turn left uh, after that. We have a big rock looking like a troll <laughs> or something. And I find it interesting all this labeling, naming that I think humans have, have done even ever since we started to be humans. I mean, that must, must have been one of the first things we did ever since we started to talk using our language, invented language. I guess it was one of the first topics because we really needed to communicate navigation of our surroundings and uh, yeah think a lot of names in the area where we our closest area for example where we live there are really creative and uh, interesting and fascinating and it makes you imagine start to think about what could have happened here or why why is it called that? What does that mean? I think a lot of about a lot of history when I hear names because somehow names don't change that often. So sometimes or quite often I guess it's names that doesn't tell anything about today how it looks today but uh, more of what it looked like a long time ago. It's like poetry in a way, to walk along a path and uh, label it along the way. We'll take a look at the second route that I have uh, prepared and uh, tried. And it also starts from uh, Nedre Myren. Diket. Pikuporna. Underastgården, Superstenen, Barriären, Skruven, Söderstig, Skrotmossen, Klöverdeppan, Cykelberget, and this is our first kilometer. Then we walk in, the, in this direction. Capel. Korset, Klockt 
بتونند مگس این بکن بری دار بانان تندم ستیکن Gordon Nacken Tre systrar Cykelkorset And now we're at the two kilometer Stop or point And let's go on. Trollskogen. Nystup. Långsjöstup. Mellanstig. Irrskog. Stenstoppet Tre bröder Sikla vi Sikla muren Spikstigen This is our three kilometer stop Two more to go. Spiken. Morskog. Bäckstensbro. Platåstigen. Hindrarna Norrkälla Österbäck Kontrolllåsen Andra spången. This is our four kilometer stop. Söder regla. Kapellstigarna. Villostigskorset. Lockstig. Skrotmossen Söderstig Skruven Barriären Superstenen Hundrastgården This is our fifth kilometer stop. There are actually three hundred more meters till we back to where we started. So we have to pass Bikupuna Dike. And then we're back after 5.3 kilometer at Nedermyren. So now we have been uh, crossing this challenging, at least what I thought, area twice. Here's our 
this one track. And here's another. From here. And I guess the reason this is so, it's not that easy to navigate here, is because, as you can see, it's um, a small creek here, or brook. And it's actually, at least now, when I've seen it, it's completely dry. It has... Uh, couple of branches here and there are a lot of um, marshes and bogs and it's a really low altitude on this landscape and I guess if uh, there, there are actually a lot of deers here, a lot of animals I've seen I guess when uh, when they walk, it doesn't take long before it it's a path there because the ground and the soil somehow makes it easy to to make a path by just walking a couple of times. So there are actually more more uh, tracks visible on this map so sometimes you wonder if you should go right or left or it's not easy to take the information from the map and see how you're gonna behave in the real world so it's like a big wetland or marsh area this. and uh, here there are more rocks cliffs here it's really steep cliffs as you can see on the altitude lines here on the map and also these steep signs Symbols. And then it's another problem because many times the path seems to disappear into a rock. So you, it continues on the actual rock. And then it's not easy to see where it continues after. After the rock, it, you, you have to find it again, and then it's a new rock. It's a very common landscape, at least in the Swedish forests. Altering lower areas with the like moss and and. Um, Myers and uh, bogs altered with the higher rocks. So, especially this area was a bit difficult to learn to navigate through. You can see it's a bit complicated with all these small paths. Also, here the area called Irskog. Somehow tells about that it's easy to get lost here as well. It took a while before I could come from this point and reach this point. That's why I call this Irskog. To Irra in Swedish, that's to just have completely been lost and uh, walk in any direction and lost your track somehow. Also this is interesting because on this area, yeah here you can see some more of this color, but this means uh, 
impenetrable area because it's really dense and uh, not a vegetation here. So this is like the heart of the Talmos area. It's dark here almost all the time. It's really a bit creepy. Quiet. Dark. It doesn't get the uh, trees don't get much sunlight so there are at least when I was there there were no leaves, no needles, just um, very dry, very compact, dense, tall stems. So this is where the uh, this uh, old uh, creek begins on this map. I actually took some pictures with my phone and uh, I'll show you some of these, some areas I find interesting. There are, for example, a lot of foot bridges. Just very simple, simple um, foot bridges across some uh, wet areas here, mostly across this uh, old uh, creek, even though there's no water in it, it's like, yeah, maybe from the time when it was water, sometimes during some seasons maybe there is water there, I, I don't know, but um, even though you can like jump or cross it without a footbridge, there are some footbridges here. And I started to find it really interesting, the designs of them. So for example we have something I call the first Spongen, the first foot bridge, located here. Because this was the first distance, part of the distance that I explored. Then it, this was the first footbridge, and then we have the second footbridge, Andraspongen. one of my labels for the for the trail. Another label was uh, Beck Spongen. Small footbridge here over this little creek. And also something I call Speaken. Means the nail. Actually, really narrow bridge someone has put there, and it's not <laughs> very easy to cross over because it's really sharp. It looks like a nail, but it's quite fun actually <laughs> to try to cross it. And I mean, it doesn't matter if if you fall because it's really shallow and it's no water underneath so and then uh, yeah this is uh, 
this small footbridge I discovered just yesterday. Call it uh, the Bextian's Brew. It's somehow hidden here. Near this uh, big uh, rock that I call the Bextian. Big rock by the creek. So that's Bextian's Brew. And then we have um, also a bit hidden Mossbrun, also labeled on one of my jogging routes. It looked really ancient. So it was a lot of moss on it. It looked really old. I'm not sure if it if you can walk on it. Because it's not exactly on the track, it's a bit on the side here. And um, do we have more? Yeah, we have here along the um, the uh, illuminated jog jogging track. It's a really big. Yeah, it's over this this little uh, creek here. That's actually a really big footbridge, very wide and uh, well constructed. A lot of people running and walking here, skiing in the winter I guess. And there's actually a southern version of it here, along this track. So I call it the Nora Parade. This is Södra Parat. Look exactly the same. And um, I think it's a small footbridge here as well. Over this brook. I'm not sure I have given it a name yet. And um, there are some more interesting features here, I think, that you find after a while. Yeah, I can show you a picture of the Vilostings Korset where I was completely lost the first day trying to navigate here. You can see there are tracks in every direction here. And um, An interesting part of the of the forest. It's really high altitude, so like a mountain or high cliff. And uh, I named it Nakken. Actually, I read about it before. That's why I call it Nakken. So I read that it gave name to this whole area, this whole city called Nakka. And I read that when you were traveling into towards Stockholm a long time ago, you mostly went by boat, came this way. And then it was like a landmark, you could see this, something reminded of a neck, somehow. This high mountain, that's why it's called Nacken. And um, here I found uh, also a landmark that I found easy to use for navigation. I, I renamed it the Three Sisters. Three Sistrar. Three big rocks 
close to each other and also we have the three brothers here three brother also three rocks no. close formation Sving thread tree that uh, with a stem that's really curved. Maybe I can show you the start and the stop. This is an old, uh, it used to be an old chapel here, not just old chapel, in the 19th century. But the, the chapel, I guess it's not here anymore, but you can find the, the oh, I'm not sure about the word, clock donut, the church bell tower, in a way. It's really surprise when you're just uh, running in the forest and you all of a sudden you see this old tower so it's an old cemetery here Yes, that's what I wanted to show you today. Yeah, and one more thing. Siklamuran. There were some remains of something that made me think of an old wall or a ruin or something located here and uh, I've seen on maps that it's actually right on the border between Stockholm and Nacka so maybe it was some kind of mark for or a border even if it wasn't I call it Sikla Muren the wall of Sikla Sikla is this part of this part of Stockholm and uh, this part of Nacka. You can see it here, written Sikla. So now you see parts of the Almosan and uh, parts of uh, Naka Nature Reserve area. Hope you enjoyed this video and uh, thank you so much for watching. See you next time. Sleep well. Take care.